the total recommendation from the county executive, and then if there are any particular decision points um, that we need to address, um, and then we'll open it up for any questions that we might have. Ms. Chen. Thank you, so Ms. Ms. Navarro. I'm, I actually have a couple of slides to frame the conversation, which I'll share. Um, I'll just run through to show the context of the first three items today, um, a little bit discussion on our strategic vision discussion, and then we'll go into each agenda item and the recommended budget. Right. So today at the GO committee, we'll be discussing the community engagement cluster, the public information office, the core services, and also MC311. So overarching understanding of these three uh, divisions is not that they are the same or that they're even under the same umbrella, but that their function is to communicate and respond to residents. Last year's pandemic created a critical unmet immediate need to communicate life-saving information to residents. And we needed to use a multicultural and multilingual approach and address a 24 seven news cycle. Um, the community engagement cluster with community partnerships, commission for women, Charles Gilcrest Center and the volunteer center, regional services directors and PIO core and MC301 rose to that challenge beautifully last year. Um, I also wanted to note that the that it was a countywide effort in order to communicate and respond to residents uh, this quickly. It required strategic coordination among multiple departments, forced breakdown of the government silo structure of departments. Um, the success was based on all of these departments and their urgency and desire to execute this um, important information and the diverse staff and language, culture, zip code, and lifespan that uh, that these entities span. This includes council PIO, the business advancement team, the cable, uh, television communications, emergency management, homeland security, public health, health and human services, and the technology and enterprise business services. So a lot going on. Um, this was in response to committee members wanting to see that this is a much more larger strategic effort to communicate and respond to residents. So just a, very quickly on what our current model for public information and communications is so that we're all on the same page. We have traditionally had a message, which then is shifted to a press release and a graphic, then translated and then distributed. So when there is a need for more messages, you'll we typically, as you'll see in this recommended budget and during last year, we will add people, people with laptops, we'll add money um, in order to increase the distribution of the message. That is the traditional model that we're working in. Um, the recommendations you'll see for today is um, within this model of making sure we increase distribution to, uh, to residents. The question going forward is what is the strategic vision of the county's public information and communication? So in the future, we will not only have increased messages, we will have increased cultures and languages to address. And so the question we'd want to answer um, uh, in our work sessions and working groups over the next year is how can we do this by increasing efficiency and productivity? How can we do it so it's less time, less cost, and that we're leveraging new technology? And finally, um, using this context and uh, background really um, to frame our discussions today, uh, you, what you'll see in the community engagement cluster, um, as well as the public information and MC3 in one budget in this committee is that there's been department investments made, um, significant investments made in personnel and technology to meet these short term critical unmet needs. Um, one of the recommendations um, outside of approving these investments is to build upon the OLO report uh, that was conducted on MC3 and 1 and identify best practices in highly responsive government communications pre and post pandemic. And finally, to begin cross functional working group this summer with all of these um, entities, as well as the second slide from before to start developing that strategic vision uh, that will get us to um, our next model. And with that, I will stop sharing and we can enter into the first item of reviewing the operating budget for a community engagement cluster. 
Perfect. Um, and it's my understanding that the recommendation from the executive is 6048203 which is 42.7% above the FY21. Uh, and it, there is an, a considerable addition of FTEs, but this is, in my, if I understood correctly, has to do with the establishment of a permanent translation unit and also increasing capacity for multilingual, multicultural communications. Is that right, Ms. Chen? Do I have that right? Yes. Yes, it's, okay. an inc it's a translations unit as well as a uh, placemaking funds for White Oak and the White Flint Peak District. Uh, and this is, the, as we frame the discussion, more of meeting the critical short-term need. Um, we will continue to need to expand and uh, revise this model going forward to, to, to meet future needs. Thank you so much, and it's good to see everybody here. Um, so I, I want to make a couple of observations. I think that uh, we've all in different times throughout this pandemic have made the comment that in so many ways, this pandemic has forced us to meet the moment. A lot of the things that we have had to stand up very quickly, a lot of the strategies that we had to stand up very quickly uh, were strategies that we had really examined and discussed and begun, we have begun to implement. I think the pandemic just sort of turbocharged a lot of these efforts. And they also forced us to work collaboratively with a lot of grassroots community folks um, to enhance the success of those strategies. And now I think we have really awesome frameworks and great templates uh, that we can now pretty much incorporate in how we conduct you know, business. Um, the issue of communications and, and uh, engagement, you know, outreach engagement communication was just so front and center during this pandemic, right? I mean, we knew that we recognized that literally in March of last year. Uh, and everybody just pulled, you know, came together. Um, I know that in terms of communicating with our immigrant community, very quickly, you know, Councilman Rod Reynolds and I had a conversation and it was kind of like, all right, we need to try to stand up some some models here and um you know spoke to the executive and immediately we were able to stand something up and mr hartman has been instrumental in leading that charge on the executive side we did the same on the council side um and then that also was a natural progression to the latino centric uh, covid 19 initiative for nuestra salud y bienestar and also our african-american health program initiative now the reason why i mentioned all of this is because I think we do need to take a step back to understand why um, these efforts are so critical and why, as Ms. Chen was, was just you know, discussing, why we need to really take it to the next level. Um, a couple of just things that I've been thinking about a lot, um, you know, Montgomery County Public Schools, 73% students of color. Montgomery College, 78% uh, students of color. Uh, we are waiting on the census uh, results, obviously. Um, the Park and Planning has a really great um, presentation that I've asked our council president and vice president to schedule. Uh, they made this presentation to the redistricting committee regarding just sort of the demographic changes across the decades. And it's, it's you know, it's it's what we know. And I and I say that to frame this this particular item in the sense that, you know, we need to really acknowledge uh, who we are, right? Who who are we? Like, what is our duty uh, in terms of providing, uh, you know, services, uh, support, responses to our constituents? Now, who are these constituents? And it is startling to think that Montgomery County Public Schools, if students the student population is 72% of color. Now, <laughs> obviously, this is an indicator of who we are. Same thing with Montgomery College, right? These institutions, I, in my opinion, are kind of like a microcosm of the trends and also who we are in the community. And so, to me, this particular item begins to formally establish a best practice in how we, in how we outreach, engage and communicate with our residents. No longer should we be talking about these items as sort of nice to have, right? Or like, you know, oh, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> 
we're no, we 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 passed that sort of framing, in my opinion, decades ago. We need to now really truly acknowledge that this is the way we conduct business. And why? Well, because if we don't do that, not only do we hit the mark on what we are here to do, but like we saw during the pandemic, it can have life and death consequences. Our, our, our black community had, you know, the highest mortality rates. We saw the zip codes. We knew where folks were. The Latino community disproportionately had the highest number of cases. We saw the zip codes. We knew where they were. And that is why being proactive, but also responsive is so important. And so I am thrilled to see the proposal for the translation and interpretation unit. Um, I have recommended this forever because MCPS, when I was a member of the board, I was, you know, instrumental in getting that situated at MCPS um, as a matter of practice. So I'm really excited. Um, and I know Mr. Hudson uh, heard me loud and clear because I kept saying that. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited that the executive has made a decision to, to establish this. This is critical. This is really critical. You know, we can no longer be in a situation where we're literally, you know, in our offices um, doing, tran you know, translating things uh, that need to go to the general public. We should have something that is centralized and that is also culturally appropriate. Uh, so I'm really excited about um, this direction, you know, where we're headed and want to personally thank all of you because you've had to all play like a real pivotal role um, in responding to a pandemic. <laughs> like I always say, without a manual, you know, with no like real, no, no, it's just kind of like step up and do it on the spot. And you've done extraordinary work. I believe that's why we are where we are right now in terms of our numbers. Uh, and that is no small feat. So I, I just, you know, literally take my head off to each and every one of you for stepping up, for doing everything you could, for stepping out of your comfort zone many times to, to respond in a significant way. Um, and all of you know that I'm passionate about all of this because it's just been my life's work. Uh, and, um, and I just really feel good that we're, I think, getting to a point where it, I think we're getting to that fidelity point where we can say, yes, of course we value our diversity, but it's not just a buzz phrase. Um, we really do um, step up and, you know, and serve all of our residents. So that's, that's a very exciting thing. And um, I've talked a lot. So I don't know, Councilmember Katz, if you have any comments, and then if anybody wants to, you know, make any comments regarding the, the recommendation. Well, well, thank you, Madam Chair. You certainly said it well. I want to thank Ms. Chen and, and everyone else who worked on this packet. Obviously, when you started out by saying we have 19 uh, areas of discussion today, and, and we're not going to be able to spend as much time, even though I think 10 of them are, are, uh, are quick or quicker um, yes. uh, uh, consent items. But, but uh, I do think it's extremely necessary that we especially talk about the first uh, item, the item we're talking about now. I, I do agree with staff suggestions um, for the recommend, uh, the approval of the uh, county executives um, uh, suggest, uh, suggested submitted budget. Um, I also agree that we should have the um, joint meetings this summer with uh, between government operations and health and human service for the uh, for the various work session topics and I'm sure as we go through the discussions of those work session topics we'll think of a few more work session topics that we need as well but I, I do want to uh, echo what you've said I'm not going to repeat what you said but I do want to echo what you've said that that we do it is imperative that we communicate we can all understand that but it was because of you and, and Council Member Albernaz and, and others, but certainly because of you two, that we realized that as much as we meant to communicate uh, uh, in the right way, we weren't always communicating so that people knew what we were talking about, what we were communicating about. And that is a huge problem. So I think this is a, a great step in the right direction. And we we're going to have to continue to to do more and more and more, and um, we need to think about all the languages that we need to be 
talking to to people in there so that they too realize that they are and they are a great part of their community and that we're very very honored to have them here so that they need to hear that what a great part of our community they are and how uh, and how happy we are so with that uh, um uh, I know that this is going to be a, a uh, ongoing conversation, so uh, I certainly am supportive of staff suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Katz. And yes, I think it's important to know for the record that we are going to have subsequent conversations probably in the summer um, to make sure that we are aligning all of these different approaches and that we're leveraging the resources that we have. I think that we have extraordinary opportunities to do that. And uh, even though we're taking these obviously items separately, there is a lot of uh, this crossover and all these connections that we do need to, to definitely align. Um, so I think with that, anybody would like to make some comments before we vote? Any additional observations? I believe you I all learned the basically. lesson. I think, the lesson. Re- I think they realize they should take yes as a as a good uh, as a good I opportunity. Yes. I was I was going to invoke uh, the uh, words of our esteemed former county executive legate that when you know that you've got the votes and you're moving forward, it's best to just not say anything. Right. I always remember him saying that. So yeah. perhaps that has just continued to be the practice. Um, okay. So I think with that, without objection, we will uh, we will approve the county executive's recommendation. Uh, of uh, six million forty-eight thousand two hundred and three, and I'm so thrilled uh, that you will continue to go forward and get going on this work, and can't wait to to hear more about it. Um, so, with that, thank you, everybody. It's good to see everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. All right. Okay. So, our next item is Public Information Office, and as I was saying earlier, um, all of these things are somewhat connected, and so we will be obviously having subsequent conversations about all of that. Um, and uh, so with this, let's see, this item, I, I'm looking at my notes up here. So I think we do have, of course, Mr. Barry Hudson. Uh, I believe we have Mr. Uh, Roberts also listed here, who is from MC311, Ms. Roper, Director of the Technology and Enterprise Business Solutions Department, and Ms. Um, Jamie Kura from uh, Office of Management and Budget. So uh, let's see, Ms. Chen, can you just give us a brief overview, and then we will ask Mr. Hudson and Ms. Roper if if they have any additional comments, as well as Mr. Roberts. Great. Uh, Just one uh, point of correction is that um, Ms. Mirka is unable to make the meeting today, so uh, Ms. Hudson, so she's fine, but she's still here in in her place. Um, Okay. Okay, great. So for the public of information uh, core, we'll be doing this in two sections. First on the public information core, which is the uh, public relations and web con- um, web design and content management part. Um, the recommended budget is increase of about 19%, um, mainly in the operating costs of the of the Office of Public Information. This we will need to uh, discuss and approve separately from MC311. That's what we've been instructed. So if we want anyone want to, from the PIO core side, uh, comment. Uh, Let me. uh, There you go. You just muted yourself, Barry. Barry, you're on mute. All right, on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. As they said in the old commercial, um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank you for having us here today, and and don't want to take up too much time with niceties, but um, we we are we're pleased to hear, be here today to talk about our budget. Um, in terms of the increases, and I think um, Ms. Chen re- re- kind of reiterated the point of some of the additional resources that are in there um, on the PIO core side. Um, there are a couple of, of, of positions. We lost a position last year. We've added one in uh, and enhanced that position um, as a result of that. And there are a lot of things we learned from COVID. And I think um, uh, Council Member Navarro hit the nail on the head. Um, we, we learned a lot, but what we don't want to do is, t- is not take those learnings and carry them forward. Um, so our budget represents uh, some adjustments there. 
uh, to, from a staffing perspective, we've enhanced there. Um, and in addition to that, um, there's some also some additional dollars related to um, the, that personnel line item that, that does enhance our budget by, by a considerable amount of 19%. So um, it's our hope that uh, this committee will approve that adjustment and uh, carry us forward with it. All right, uh, anything else, Ms. Chen, that we need to discuss regarding that particular portion? No, oh, not, not on this. We're good on the core. Thank you. Okay. All right, Councilmember Katz, any questions regarding this piece? No, I, I agree with staff recommendations. Thank you. All right. Okay. So without objection, we will approve that. Ms. Chen? And just another point of clarification, I want to check if Councilmember Friedson is on. I don't know, I Sorry? assume a 2 0. I saw if Councilmember Friedson is on, just want to make sure the vote is 2 0. Yeah, that's me. I'm, okay. I'm on audio. Okay, okay great. I'm listening. I'm listening in. I'm, 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 I'm okay here. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. I'll, I'll let you know. I'm hoping to be on video shortly. Okay, no problem. Um, Dr. Yes, should I take over? Uh, um, we're not going to turn our attention to the MC311 element within the PIO budget. It's traditional in front of GO and full council to take them as separate activities. So you have in front of you my recommendations for the $4,322,078, which represents a 5.5% increase. Uh, for the budget of the MC311 Center. The, it also includes one additional FTE, full-time equivalent uh, resource. Uh, um, my recommendation is simple. Um, uh, two are structural. Uh, one is to uh, have a joint discussion with the HHS committee for some of the reasons that Ms. Chen began to, to list. We need to have a centralized and organized and a coordinated uh, a, a way of listening to our residents. And uh, uh, Ms. Navarro, you were present uh, for the HHS discussion that uh, um, uh, included the uh, approval, at least at the HHS level, of a new uh, call center. And uh, from my viewpoint, as simply someone who observes the flow of uh, incoming calls for service, I'm always an advocate of centralizing the intake and then decentralizing the response. Right now, the HHS seems to be saying uh, that the department needs to send to not only um, uh, have the responsibility for the response, but also the responsibility for the intake. And that, I think, is gives me some some cause to uh, to to think. So, as a consequence, I'd recommend one that you meet with the HHS committee sometime after the budget is over to begin to organize a more coherent way of how we listen and how we respond to residents, which aligns very much to Ms. Chen's recommendation. Number two, my second uh, proposal is to, in fact, um, uh, ask the OLO, the Office of the Legislative Oversight, to do a comprehensive, deep study of how we listen what are the technologies underlying our listening methodology, how we respond, and, and also equally important, how we make sure that the executive branch organizations uh, are kept uh, uh, honest and, are, uh, and uh, have their feet kept to the fire in terms of delivering. Uh, the technical term for that is service level agreements, SLAs, and it's time to review those SLA stra strategies uh, once again. My third and easiest recommendation is to adopt the executive's recommendation. With that, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Ms. Navarro. Thank you so much, Dr. Chiragas. I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, also mention, I you know I agree with your recommendations. I believe that there was this overarching recommendation from council staff that the committee, um, for the committee to assign to the Office of Legislative Oversight uh, a report on open government best practices and communication, digital strategy, public affairs, and community outreach to reimagine the next generation model to increase county government responsiveness. And I, I think that that's folded in there. So I would love um, for Ms. Chen and Dr. Torregas if you can perhaps put something together that the committee can then uh, directly um, 
uh, sent over to sent over to the Office of Legislative Oversight for consideration, um, and of course, you know, taking also in you know very much all of this guided by the conversation we just had in terms of the very diverse uh, county population and of course you know racial equity, social justice, this whole notion of cultural proficiency, etc. It's not an easy task, and again, I feel like everybody has definitely come forward with the best possible uh, solutions, especially through this pandemic. But, you know, it's never too late um, to begin to rethink and be, you know, super proactive about all of these issues. I have said to my staff time and time again, because they remind me that in 2019, when I was council president, I was very interested in us, you know, being proactive and putting forth all these protocols. And literally once I said, heaven forbid we ever have a national emergency. And now I'm like, I can't believe I said that in 2019 because I never knew, of course, that in 2020 we would have a sustained and here 2021, uh, you know, global real emergency. So, so I, you know, big believer in the fact that never too late to begin to just put all those plans in place and update them, I guess, is, is real the key, the key, key question. Um, let's see. So, um, anything you'd like to add, Ms. Roper or Mr. Roberts? I would just like to say that, um, you know, we did take advantage of some of the resources that we um, had in place. And as part of our new strategy moving forward, um, we did conduct a, a comprehensive um, business process reengineering to really kind of see where the holdup were um, associated with the departments, finding out that, you know, it doesn't all stop in 311, that HHS, uh, the two HH call centers uh, were part of the of the uh, challenges as well. I also just wanted to make sure that I mentioned two things uh, as it relates to our strategy for uh, multi-channels for residents to be able to interface um, with with the county uh, that we had to find different ways for residents to get information that they needed. And we were able to, um, to implement a chat bot. And that chat bot has, um, has already, um, has about approximately 38,000 visits in the last 90 days and over 9,000 web chats per week. And, you know, we can talk about what that means, but it really was a way to reduce, uh, calls, uh, going to humans. And to be able to address uh, some of the most pertinent information that people needed to know uh, in order to get the services that they needed. And, and then the other aspect of that was a virtual agent that we were able to implement. We did all of that in about a week, and um, it's been highly effective. We want to see more of that. And we want to really focus in on having multiple ways for residents to get the information that they need. It was a con it was a combined effort uh, with Barry's team and HHS, and we're pleased with it. We know we need to do more work, but we're pleased with it. And I can remember saying a while back that we were going to do a chat bot. And I remember Mrs. Navarro said, okay, a chat bot, okay. <laughs> but we, we've done that and we want to expand and we've got some other departments interested. So, you know, we'll move forward with the technology and innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, before I forget also, I, I want to make sure that uh, Dr. Jorgas, Ms. Chenna, Dr. Jorgas, you mentioned the HHS session on uh, their call center. And, you know, I'm a big believer in not working in silos. So I, I very much, I didn't catch it in time, but very much would like for now on for that to be a geo HHS item so that everybody can be on the same page. So we're not having these like, you know, conversations everywhere. Uh, anybody else would like to make comments? I just wanted to, uh, this is Brian Roberts. I just wanted to mention that uh, the HHS effort is um, something that we are aware of. And um, we have set up several uh, work groups. Um, there are eight of them, probably six of them are, are active with um, HHS and the um, Office of Eligibility and Support Services to uh, redesign uh, the processes between our two departments. And uh, so it's not just um, uh, an addition of people, it's it's a wholesale change of processes. And we hope at the end of that, um, 
the customer will have a much better experience and the entire process will will take less time. And that will be a prelude to future implementations of of, uh, of technology. So rather than just um, uh, spending a lot of money to do the same thing, uh, we're looking to reduce the number of, of steps that a customer has to go through, reduce the length of time customers have to wait to get the information and the services they need. And it's obviously important across the board. We're doing that with uh, uh, permitting services. We're doing that with OHR. We're doing that with a number of different departments. But of course, right now, uh, with the pandemic uh, in social services and public health, it's um, extremely important. And so that's um, why we're spending so much uh, effort there. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Appreciate that. Councilor Mercats, I think you had. Yeah, I, I, you, you, all, you, everyone has said it well. I did think it should be noted, uh, 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 Council Chair, uh, the uh, Committee Chair, that that yes, you were Council President in 2019 and said what would happen if there was a national emergency, and I became President in 2020 <laughs> and there was a national emergency. So it was, we found out. We found out. It was what like a tag team thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate all that. Now. Um, but I did want to make the note about no silos. And I and I do agree with you wholeheartedly. When someone has an issue and they want to contact Montgomery County, they don't care what department is going to handle it. They care that it's going to be handled. And that is the most important part of our of our abilities, our functions. I mean, I, I know that it's like when, when I went to the dentist this week and he painstakingly, and I guess that's a good word to say, explained to me what he was going to do candidly. I, I, I wanted him just to do it. He does a wonderful job, but I wanted him to do it. I didn't need to hear all the technology, all, all everything that was going to happen. And that's the same thing when someone calls us. They want the job done. So I think we are trying our best to do better and better. We have a ways to go, obviously. And, and I think that this, that this uh, budget will help us get there. And I agree with, with staff's recommendations on this, as well as the joint conversations and the conversations with the other, uh, on the other topics. They're needed. We need to continue them. We need to, we need to, as I say uh, constantly, not only do we need to, to, uh, talk about them, we need to fund them so that we can actually do them. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so with that, before we vote, uh, the only thing I will say, since Ms. Roper talked about the chat bot and you know and how I was a little skeptical, I'm still I'm still hoping that we will get to the point of that app, you know, that app, so that folks can just very quickly access thing on their phone. So that that will be the next the next thing that we should all uh, you know start working on. Uh, since since I'm constantly asked about that when we were out there in the community. Um, and I know that we've, we've discussed this before, so we'll, we can talk about that in another session after budget as well. Um, all right, so without objection, then we will accept the county executive's recommended um, request. Uh, and by the way, it's good to see you, Crystal. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> thank all right. You. All right. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you for everything you've done. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. So now on to, uh, I believe it's item four. Is that right? Or are we, are we on that already? Cause we, uh, did. I believe you are keep right. Track. I think Dr. Yes. Greg has added his in with the other. So being very efficient, Dr. Torregas. All right. So for this item, I believe we have Ms. Olson and also Ms. Rodriguez Hernandez that have worked on this particular, um, item. And uh, of course, we have Ms. Ward, who is the director of our Office of Racial Equity and Social Social Justice. Ms. Hawa, who is a um, she's a fiscal and policy analyst for the Office of Management and Budget. And it's good to see you, Mr. Friedson. Councilmember Friedson is appearing wow. on the camera. It's good to see you. Um, I okay. I <laughs> <laughs> Let me turn it over to Miss um, Olson, but also um, just you know general remarks. Obviously, this is a very exciting um, item because you know we've worked really hard once again. You know, before this was 2019. You know, right before we had 
2020 come uh, to uh, give us not only the pandemic, but a renewed reckoning with systemic racism. And uh, it was, you know, pretty amazing that this jurisdiction, this county had begun to do work to put a lot of things in place. Uh, and I believe that um, if there is a measure of success that could be almost anecdotal, the fact that almost everywhere I go in any kind of policy discussion, um, you know, equity uh, is always mentioned. And that to me is incredible because, you know, when you start seeing culture change, how people talk and the things that they pay attention to when you start hearing it over and over again, to me is the signal that folks have made the decision that this needs to be front and center. And once again, given who we are, uh, who Montgomery County is in terms of our demographics, um, this is paramount in everything that we do. So a lot of great work has taken place. A lot of very important, um, you know, uh, milestones, I think, uh, for the county council, of course, welcome, welcoming Ms. Uh, Liz Olson uh, to help us also navigate this issue through our work has been instrumental. And, uh, and also some of the um, uh, additions that we've made uh, to uh, not only the legislation, but also to strengthen um, this board's office in order to really, truly be able to uh, implement all of this fidelity. So I am thrilled. I, I, I think, you know, one of the most recent awesome things that happened is that the city of Gaithersburg did adopt a resolution in, uh, that it was spearheaded by council member Lorian Sales. And, you know, she reached out to me uh, and we spent almost two hours where I went, you know, step by step sharing with her what we had done uh, and share all of the materials, everything that um, we had put out there so that she wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel because that is the beautiful part of this. I did the same thing with King County and they were very generous. And so a lot of it meant that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel uh, when putting to this proposal together and that my colleagues all were able to then add whatever they needed. Um, but that's exciting that, uh, the, you know, city of Gaithersburg has been able to adopt this and then it is modeled after the legislation that we adopted in 2019. And I hope, you know, anytime I get a call, I'm just super generous with the information because again, it's very important that, um, different jurisdictions and different municipalities, et cetera, align with the work that way we're not working in silos so that is absolutely awesome uh and so so with that let me uh, turn it over to miss olson to give us a little bit of an overview of what is in front of us and then um miss ward um in case you have you know any additional um thoughts and then we can uh, turn it over for questions for my colleagues miss olson thank you chair navarro so the executive's FY22 recommended operating budget for the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice totals $1,001,712, an increase of about $420,000 or 72.3% from the FY21 approved budget. This increase is primarily due to an increase of four FTEs, and these positions are aligned with the requirements placed on the office by the county's Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. Key changes in the executive's recommended budget include an increase of about 240,000 for two positions that were added mid-year FY21 via supplemental appropriation. And I do have one correction. The packet states that both those positions were program manager positions. However, only one was a program manager and the other was an administrative assistant. There are currently two program managers and one administrative assistant in the office who all started in FY21. One program manager filled a role previously classified as a community outreach manager position, and um, that person joined the office in December 2020. A second program manager filled the position that was added mid-year FY21 and started last week. So uh, apologies for that error. The community outreach manager position was reclassified as a program manager position for a decreased cost of about $3,000 to better serve OREsj's focus on training departments and assisting them with developing policies, programs, and procedures. And the executive's recommended budget also includes an increase of about 182,000 for two additional program manager roles for FY22. There's also a decrease of, of uh, 16,000, which reflects a shift in funding for stipends for the public members of the Racial Equity and Social Justice Advisory Committee, 
which will be funded by the non-departmental account for boards, committees, and commissions starting in FY2020. And just to provide a little bit more detail about the two additional program manager roles for 2022, one position will be responsible for assisting departments in the use of racial equity budget tools and will research industry best practices to update these tools as well as support leadership in developing and implementing strategies to advance racial equity. And the second position will work with county departments on data analysis to define programs, outcomes, strategies, and performance measures. And if funded, ORESJ expects to fill these positions by fall of 2021. The office has also provided updates on the implementation of the county's Racial Equity and Social Justice Act, and there's more information about the law included in the packet. The law requires the office to perform an equity assessment to identify policies and practices that must be modified to address racial and social justice disparities. And ORESJ will contract with a vendor to assist departments with utilizing an equity assessment beginning in the fall of 2021. These assessments will inform departmental racial equity and social justice action plans, which are expected to be completed by spring of 2022. ORESG, OREsj and the Office of the County Attorney are currently working to revise draft regulations implementing the law and expects to present the regulations to council by the end of this month. And in terms of training, OREsj began training departmental racial equity leads in September 2020 and has trained 30 leads to date. Each lead has received 40 hours of racial equity training and will receive 72 more hours as they work with their racial equity core teams and develop racial equity action plans. The office will also begin offering two virtual racial equity trainings to all county employees beginning in the spring and summer of 2021. And additionally, OREsj will offer the two day racial equity Institute phase one training to 45 additional department directors senior staff and new racial equity leads in the spring and summer of 2021. OREsj is also charged with staffing the racial equity and social justice advisory committee, which has met monthly since September 2020. The committee has written letters to Governor Hogan and, count and the county executive regarding racial equity in the distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. And members are currently working to plan events to provide learning experiences regarding racial equity for county residents and officials. <clears throat> uh, so, in terms of applying a racial equity lens to budget decisions in the executive's FY22 recommended operating budget, OMB worked with OREsj to develop a set of budget equity questions for departments, which were included in the program proposal form. Those questions are included in the packet. OMB received a range of responses to these questions, with some departments providing more refined answers than others. Uh, council staff is documenting these responses to establish an official baseline for each department and to track progress over the next year. And OR, OREsj is currently working with OMB to develop a new budget equity tool with an enhanced set of questions and information to assist departments in drafting more robust racial equity responses in their program proposals for FY23. The new tool will be informed by conversations with other jurisdictions implementing budget equity tools, as well as conversations with council staff. And OREsj and OMB will then provide training to departments on the new tool once it's finalized. The additional staffing for the office and additional racial equity training mentioned previously will also provide departments with a deeper understanding of how to apply racial equity frameworks to their decision making. The regulations implementing the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act will also instruct departments to disaggregate their data, which will further facilitate a more robust racial equity analysis. So that concludes the overview and council staff recommends approval of the FY22 Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice Operating Budget as recommended by the county executive. Thank you so much, Ms. Olson. Ms. Ward. Um, I wanna first thank Liz um, for working with us and of course, thank the council members uh, for their work on this uh, initiative for Gosh, it feels like three or four years now. Um, <laughs> this one year feels like a whole two years. Um, so yes, the uh, Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice um, is excited about what lays ahead of them. Uh, we have over the last year, um, while we've done a few formal trainings, have done a lot of informal training, and that is going to offices and uh, to senior leadership and presenting um, basically the framework of what we're doing. So while we seeded 
what racial equity is and what our expectations are with the community. We did not do a lot of that with our staff. And so we spent a good amount of this year uh, doing that with our staff. And so much like the county um, council member and Navarro said now, there are very few rooms you can go into. Where people are not talking about the impact of racial equity. Um, we spend much of our time talking to our MLS uh, directors, much of our time even talking to commissions and boards, conducting conversations, uh, facilitating conversations on race, and particularly in the atmosphere we're living in uh, with COVID and the racial injustices that we are dealing with, uh, with boards, commissions, as well as um, other rank and file staff. We am happy to say that we have brought in two program managers, one of which just joined us last week on April 27th, uh, Sarah Alvarez. Sarah is a policy analyst and has already started to jump in and started to work on our new uh, budget tool, uh, which Veronica and our Office of Management and Budget is also uh, helping on. We had a very rudimentary tool uh, at the beginning of this budget, which really gave us a baseline of the understanding that um, that offices had one of racial equity and how they were implementing racial equity. And we hope that this tool will give us the data and the information that we need so that we are, are, are more centered in what we are actually doing and actually getting to a point of, of uh, closer to the racial equity outcomes that we desire. Um, what else we've done? I just, I want to say that this has been a challenging year that COVID has presented us with uh, opportunities uh, uh, to be in many rooms and many discussions, whether it's on health equity, uh, as well as um, economic equity, and how this this pandemic and this crisis has landed on people of color in this county in particular. Um, I'm looking forward to to bringing on new staff if we has, as we have new responsibilities. Um, a few of which we've already started to take up, including uh, giving a racial equity analysis to the supplemental appropriations that come from the executive's office. We've also brought on two new members to our racial equity and social justice committee, which is barreling ahead with their mandate. Uh, looking forward to bringing those two members on. Um, and then, yeah, getting our data analysis and getting a more, more robust budget tool um, in this next year. I'm looking forward to, to that work. Thank you so much uh, for those um, comments and updates. I was wondering regarding the uh, regulations, um, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about when we can expect that and are, are sure. there still some just issues regarding that, like sure. barriers or anything like that? Sure. So right now we have uh, draft regulations in our office of, of a county attorney, and we are working through the details of those uh, of those regulations. We have put in very detailed um portions, including a community engagement plan, including what you can expect or what we should expect in a racial equity and social justice action plan, uh, what it actually looks like uh, to, to, to disaggregate data, what data should be disaggregated. And so we're just going, um, we are refining what, what that looks like and what the, uh, the legality or, um, yeah, the legality of some of the, the details of our regulations. I found that our regulations are very different from any I've seen all around the country. DC just actually released their regulations on their new REACH Act on April 20th. And I would say that ours are a tad bit more um, detailed than even theirs are. So uh, I am hopeful that we will be able to get those to you all so that you all can participate in the process of refining them as well um, by the end of this month. Awesome. I really appreciate you uh, sharing um, sort of the process for the budget tool. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I must admit that, you know, in some of our conversations thus far, when we ask directors or even in some of the, um, I think we've had a few interviews for directors, et cetera, and when that question comes up, um, inevitably either the response is, you know, well, we have this program, you know, mm -hmm. or, yeah. well, we're going to work with Ms. Ward. And mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's very important for department heads, managers, et cetera, to understand that that is not what we're trying to do here, right? It's not about just thinking, well, let me check the box. I'm going to work with this word. Therefore, I'm done with racial equity and social justice. Or, yeah, we have a sub, you know, program that subsidizes the costs of, you know, renting public facilities. That was actually a bill that I introduced like five years ago. And therefore, we're done, you know, that there has to be an understanding of, 
the baseline and then also where we're headed. So I, I can't wait, you know, to see how that will be refined and how that will show up during um, our next budget, you know, process. That's yeah. really good to know. Yeah. I what I found in my discussions with um, chief equity officers in San Antonio and Alexandria and Fairfax and other parts of the country is that oftentimes they are refining their budget tool, quite frankly, every year. You know, I was talking to, like I said, folks in San Antonio and Denver, and they're like three, they have had three budget tools in three years in trying to help their directors and their um and their staff refine one what racial equity is right what it actually looks like in policy and programs and procedures and then really giving them an opportunity to examine their work um, in a way where they can actually um, demonstrate that to us we, we're not trying to play gotcha we want people to be able to give us honest answers so that we can have an honest assessment and so we can find places to to insert uh, mm -hmm. a racial equity lens into these policies and procedures. And mm -hmm. so um, I'm expecting that with training, both on the budget equity tool and training in general, that those answers will be more refined in the next budget cycle. Awesome. All right, I think that's all I had. Uh, any questions from my colleagues or comments? No? Okay, so without objection, we will uh, accept the county executive's recommended budget and which in this case it is pulling up my notes because my uh, iPad went dark uh, I believe it's a million dollars 712 um, which is an increase of about 72.3 which uh, uh, reflects the additional staffing that is needed in order to provide the service all right well thank you so much Ms. Olson and Ms. Ward really appreciate as well as Ms. Hawa for being here today thank you Thank you. Okay, so the next item in front of us is the Office of County Executive, and for that I believe Mr. Camacho has prepared a uh, packet for us, and I do see Ms. Uh, Kasiri here, as well as Ms. Salem, uh, and with that, let's, let's see um, Mr. Camacho what is the recommendation, and then we'll see if Ms. Kasiri has any additional remarks. Great, yes, uh, good afternoon, Council Members. Um, so. The county executive's recommended budget as transmitted um, in March was um, $5,641,962 for the office of the county executive. I do want to note that um, the county executive has since sent an amendment that would shift funding from the office of intergovernmental relations to the office of the county executive uh, for the administration of a federal real estate services contract and uh, the geo committee discussed this at the um, work session last week so that would change the budget slightly um, so um, as it was transmitted in march the office of the county executive's budget was around forty one thousand seven hundred forty five dollars less than the fy 21 approved budget with that shift it would now be an increase of $32,655 or really 0.01% difference from the FY21 approved budget. Um, there's also one reduction um, in FTEs. So um, in FY21, the county executive's recommended budget for the office of the county executive um, included 33.7 FTEs. Now it is uh, 32.7, which um, reflects the shifting of the chief digital officer from the office of the county executive to um, the department of technology services um, the council enacted this um, change through bill 3020 um, on august 7th 2020 um, with regards to other changes um, councils have identified two key issues um, i already kind of explained one which is that shift in funding from the office of intergovernmental relations to the office of the county executive um, but the county executive has also proposed funding for a new director of strategic partnerships. Um, this position would basically um, focus on coordinating um, and reviewing executive regulations, um, be a liaison with the county council, um, and develop executive positions on testimony uh, on council matters. So really just a, um, a liaison between the council and the county executive. Um, so 
the estimated cost of this position is um, 179718 However, the county executive uh, identified turnover savings of $45,512, which um, results in a request of $134,206. Um, and you can see that in the, the table on page two of the packet. Um, the remainder of the request the $134,000. Um, the county executive worked to make this addition um, uh, revenue neutral um, and really they worked with OMB to identify other reductions elsewhere in the um, 22 budget. Um, so OMB determined that a portion of this um, $159,000 or that a portion of this uh, increase would be funded from a decrease um, in the county, the community engagement cluster budget um, through a combination of eliminating a position and also a decrease in annualized personnel costs. Um, I will also note though, that um, this director of strategic partnerships um, was actually introduced as part of bill 20, 2220 that the council did review, but did not take action on. Um, so the council would have to come back to this bill and take action in order to create this position. Um, uh, with that, I will stop there and see if Ms. Kasiri uh, has anything to add. Uh, no, I think you covered everything perfectly. And I, uh, Ms. Navarro, I just wanted to apologize. Uh, Rich Madalena was scheduled to be here today, but actually he's not at the office. So just, we are here. If you have any questions, we are here to answer. Thank you, Ms. Kassiri, appreciate it. Councilor Rafitza. Uh, thank you. So uh, this is a long time conversation. I know uh, we embarked on it last budget year. There was a lot of things going on. Uh, ultimately, there were some questions about how this was going to work. I, I do appreciate both the interest in trying to address some of the challenges with the communication between the executive branch and the legislative branch, which we all recognize uh, has significant room for improvement. And uh, we all are committed uh, to trying to improve it. That's been exacerbated by working virtually and a global pandemic and all the additional issues that we've uh, had. There were some challenges going in, certainly any challenge that you had going into uh, this COVID emergency have been uh, exacerbated uh, exponentially. And I think we all can appreciate it and, and recognize that. Um, and I do appreciate the, the effort. Um, you know, we had made a significant push to try to make it revenue neutral. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly how the revenue neutral uh, aspect of this works as we are adding, we're eliminating positions and then adding positions to the same, uh, uh, you know, potentially to the same uh, uh, office. Uh, but I do appreciate the effort there uh, as well. I, I just wanted to raise the question about process here and, and what we're planning on doing. I am personally uncomfortable with us funding a position that we haven't yet approved. I know that we're in a situation where the budget has to pass. When the budget has to pass, we're required by law to do that. But I, I did just want to get a sense, uh, you know, before we approve this and, and perhaps we can't do that today and perhaps we have to, you know, this may make more sense to be a full council conversation since since the, the, the legislation uh, to repurpose that position has to take place. But, um, you know, I totally understand the rationale behind this, totally understand and appreciate uh, the efforts that have gone into it. Uh, I just think that we should make a determination for how the council is going to proceed uh, on the bill before we uh, allocate money in the budget for a position that we haven't yet decided to approve. So I, I just was hoping to get a little clarity on that from about process standpoint and an understanding uh, of, of, of where we are on that. Ms. Kasiri, I'm sorry. May, yeah, may I, if I, uh, uh, there is no new money. There is a position that will be abolished and other savings. So if uh, you are correct, uh, if Bill 22-20, I believe, if it is not approved, basically there is, there is nothing to be added. The position that is proposed to be abolished I guess will not be abolished, and and th there is no new money here. Um, maybe well, I'm sure. so I'd like to dig into that a little bit because presumably, if, you know, we've we've been 
We've gotten a lot of uh, rhetoric about this grand restructuring effort and the 100 positions that were going to be identified by this working group that was supposed to happen by this budget, which was delayed from when it was originally going to happen. Now it's going to happen uh, moving forward. Uh, if there's been an identification of a position that could be eliminated uh, in the uh, community engagement cluster, I'm not sure as we're adding dozens and dozens and dozens of positions, many of which are desperately needed, like you know we've been talking about in this process, why we wouldn't just eliminate that position and, and, and do it. I mean, I, I'm a little confused as to how they're directly linked where we would keep a position that we've already identified as not ne needed. And if we aren't going to move forward with this, we're going to keep funding that position, even though we've already identified that it's not needed. It would seem to me that, you know, at one point we've decided that a position is not necessary. That position is eliminated. And then there's a separate question of whether or not this new position should be repurposed and therefore funded in order to provide the liaison work between the council and the county executive. But I have a little bit of trouble understanding how they're directly related. So, so, I mean, you know, to me, I, 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 if, if we want to, the decision point today is whether or not we're going to eliminate the community engagement cluster position you've identified that's not necessary, which would allow us the opportunity to, to do this position, you know, to, to include this position, whether we, you know, if, if we want to fund it and if we approve the, the bill, then I would get that. But I don't understand not taking up the abolishing of the position first. So abolishing position, I guess what we are saying is this position, Director of Community Partnership is at this point for us has more value than the other position that has been vacant. And of course, there are many positions in the government that are currently funded and were kept vacant for a variety of reasons. So that's that's what we are saying. The, the, the Director of Community Partnership is more valuable and important to county executive than the other position at this point. So therefore, we are repurposing, relocating the re resources from there to here. If the Director of strategic partnership is not approved um the legislation that is in front of you i think you're gonna be hearing it next tuesday all i'm saying is there is there, there is nothing to to i guess abolish and there is uh, uh, other fundings there's no other funding that i guess needs to be decided that's all i'm saying maybe you one, only want to abolish the position if you're going to get the new position that's, that's yeah, if, yes yes if what is the get... overlap between the position that's being abolished and the director of strategic partnerships? Because I thought the main purpose of this position was to serve as the liaison between the county council and the county executive and executive branch of Yes, government. the main purpose. Yes, what's main... the overlap? The purpose of this position is liaison. If you're asking why that position was identified in CEC, that was OMB's effort. They went through the system to find a position that possibly is not as much as needed. But so that that's there's the only I guess nexus. Is that correct? Maybe OMB can explain how that position was selected. Because I I wasn't involved with that that process. The only thing was I asked them, please. I'll have some I think I can clarify this. Does that, very does that reduce the number to ninety nine of the hundred vacant positions to abolish that? Was, was part of that effort. I mean, I just, I, I have a little bit of trouble not connecting the dots to the various things that we're doing in the budget. I mean, ultimately it's it's one county budget and, you know, we can say it's coming from here, or it's coming from there, but ultimately it's taxpayer money and it's one county budget. So to me, in many cases, it's really just a distinction without a difference. I mean, I appreciate the effort, but if you could just explain the connection that would be helpful. So a lot of this is already settled, to be honest, because in the beginning of this session, the CEC component, the the council staff made a recommendation to approve the budget as submitted, and the CEC budget as submitted included the reduction elimination of the identified position, as well as the turnover savings that naturally happen from a couple of long term 
high individual high paid individuals to you know new in, new employees so those savings are already captured in the budget and were already recommended by the SCO committee at, in the first vote of this session so regardless of what happens with the CEX position those actions for the CEC budget were already approved by this committee that's what I thought. Okay, so I, I think we've made the decision to abolish the position. Whether or not adding the funding for this position is, you know, offsets it, and that becomes, uh, you know, a, a, a you know, a, 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 a trade is an open question that we haven't quite settled. Uh, my perspective, I'll yield colleagues. I've taken enough time here, but um, I'm not comfortable yet, and we don't. And I'm not sure that we necessarily have to. Although I yield to the chair and. Uh, you know, Councilmember Katz uh, on, on on their preference, but uh, I'm not sure why we would add to the budget funding for the position until the council has made the decision on the bill. If we make the decision on the bill for that position, then that position ought to be funded in the budget or else I'm not sure why we're going to approve the bill. If we ultimately decide not to approve the bill, and uh, then, then we ought not to provide funding for a position that has no purpose, or at least is not maximized the purpose as it was intended. Uh, I'm not sure that That's we- I understand, that yeah. I mean, I, I think I think we, yeah, thank you. I, I do think that we can come back to this. Is it, is Michelson, this is, the bill is scheduled, is it? It is, it is scheduled for the next legislative day, which is May 18th. Um, and I would suggest that perhaps the committee wants to make a tentative recommendation based on approval of the bill because um, we have to do our final wrap up on the budget May 20th. So it is a, a little bit tight timing wise. So, yeah, so what I would suggest is that maybe we do a tentative, we make, we make a tentative decision, almost like a straw vote. Um, what I will add is that, you know, at least from my perspective, I think that we have had not the best experience with trying to figure out how to uh, facilitate the best kind of coordination and communication between the executive and the council. And, you know, previous administrations had a different sort of set sort of process. Um, and so I know that there has been a lot of conversation about this. And this has been at least explained to me as an attempt to improve that, um, which I think is significant because not only have we realized how tough it's been during the pandemic, but there's going to be a lot of real, you know, complicated things moving forward. Um, so I think it is important for the council to have an opportunity to obviously chime in, but given the time constraints, I don't know if it's possible, Ms. Michelson, I mean, procedurally, I mean, if we take like a straw vote and then depending on you know what happens with the bill either come back or 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 revisit but um i i mean i i understand what council member Friedson is saying and it would have been great to kind of choreograph this differently um but i i am sensitive to the need that exists um thus far i guess my only question is that so far i believe miss uh dale tibbetts had been sort of you know doing that function is that going to continue or is this sort of like the person that would be assigned as a liaison to the council alone, or is this an addition to Mr. Tibbet? Is that, how, what is that going to look like? Well, this person is the, is going to be the lead main person. In addition to Mr. Tibbet, all of us, including me, all the special assistant, but we are, our goal here is to have a single, single point of contact that clearly be able to communicate, coordinate, respond, be on top of everything that that we as the executive branch need to be as it relates to county council and be able to respond to you on a very timely and comprehensive matter. So as far as others, we all going to be involved, but we want to have a highly functioning lead person that can meet both the county council's goals, desires, needs, so as county executive, that is the only goal here. Thank you, Ms. Kassir. Councilor Merkett. Uh, I'm not on mute. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I I um, understand this really is a chicken and an egg situation, and that's what we're in. 
Uh, I do believe that we uh, should put the money in this budget. Uh, we can put a fence around it or whatever whatever we need to put around it and say if the legislation doesn't pass and the money doesn't isn't going to be spent. But I think if we don't do that and if we pass the legislation, which I think is something that is uh, we need the, the conversation, we probably uh, need the, 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 the person as well. And I think that for us to come back in a couple of weeks puts everybody in a in a in a difficult uh, position. So I believe we should approve this money with the caveat that if it doesn't pass, you don't spend it, and and so that we can move on. All right. Well, uh, so I believe that Councilmember Katz and I feel this way because I'm a Fitzen and you. On board with that approach, or, or, or well, you know, that's fine. In, in the interest of, given uh, how I've spent my day to day, and it has helped to bring me, I will uh, go along with with colleagues. I do appreciate that the general goal here. I am a little concerned with the process. I, I will say, I think the issues are much deeper than identifying an individual position, and so I would hope that uh, while this is part of that effort, that this not be thought of. Uh, as the solution to the problem, because I do think that the problem uh, is much broader and much deeper, uh, and we need to address uh, that in a much uh, bigger way. I, I uh, spending a lot of time with Ms. Kassiri on this and other uh, issues. I know your commitment uh, uh, to that and, and, and your breadth of experience in a lot of different areas, and so I just wanted to note that, but I will uh, go along with uh, colleagues in the interest of the beginning of our more collaborative and better communications approach uh, between the executive and the Thank council. You. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Murphyson. All right, so without objection, we will um, adopt the recommendation uh, with the caveat, but also obviously whatever happens with the bill, um, I guess Ms. Michelson, you will also track that for us as well, since so many things are happening at once. All right, thank you everybody, I appreciate it. Okay, so now we're going to move on to item six, which is the council office. And uh, for that, we have, of course, Ms. Michelson. Uh, and um, let's see, Ms. Marin, as well as Ms. Brockington from the executive side. Uh, just turn it over to you, Ms. Michelson, so you can walk us through. Oh, Ms. Healy is here, too. You can walk yes. us through um, the budget uh, request and, and just observations regarding um, some of the areas of need that you have highlighted, which I will say right off the bat, are areas of need that the council, the council members have been discussing uh, actively for a very uh, long time. So I think it's important to note that even though you're bringing these forward, these are absolutely based on what you have heard council members, um, you know, express some through some of our retreats as well as some other conversations, things that we have identified as. Um, areas of need because precisely how quickly and how complex um, the needs have become, uh, how, you know, just the in real time uh, and nature of our work, meaning that in terms of communicating, responding to our constituents, um, the depth and the complexity of the issues have really uh, grown exponentially. And so in order for a county council that pretty soon we'll have 11 members, um, but that is responsible for what will most likely be a $6.4 billion budget approval oversight, all the land use decisions, all the legislation. Um, we need to be true to what is necessary for this body, this institution, uh, to be effective in not only carrying out our work, but also how we engage and how we communicate with our constituents. And, you know, I'll say this because I've been here for a while. Um, there, the voices that we hear are not necessarily always representative of the entire county voices, but I always found it so interesting when I hear people say, you know, what do the council members do? And this is like a part-time thing. And, you know, and, and, and just FYI for anybody that is planning on running for the county council, it is not a part-time thing. It is more than a full-time thing. And it's kind of 24-7. Uh, and it is, you know, 
uh, interesting in all the different ways that you will be asked about issues. And if you do not respond right away, um, you know, the kind of criticism that comes at you is significant. And to that, I will only add that, uh, once again, the fact that we do represent a constituency that is so diverse means that many, you know, many of us have to do all of this work uh, in different languages with different cultural uh, aspects to it, et cetera. So it is the most wonderful job ever. It is an awesome honor. Uh, but at the same time, it has a extremely increasingly complex demand that our central uh, staff always steps up to the plate, but by no means do I believe uh, we have the capacity in our communications office as well, including our own personal offices. So I wanted to just set the stage because um, I think what Ms. Michelson has put into her um, request, in my opinion, is a it's a step forward, but no means it's what many of us believe we should have. But we understand that we are dealing with some, you know, fiscal constraints. Um, and so um, I just want to, you know, thank, thank all of you. And thank you, Ms. Michelson, for listening and for making sure that you advocate for, for what is needed. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Right. Um, I want to start out by first thanking Ms. Uh, Brockington Sally, who's um, stepping in for some of her colleagues on numerous budgets today. Um, and also to thank Ms. Marin, who is um, our HR liaison and lead and is responsible for really putting together and tracking our council budget um, throughout the year. And she does a fabulous job. So um, I want to thank her so much for all her efforts on our behalf. Um, so we're doing this in two parts. First, the council office budget, then the communications NDA. Uh, for the council office budget this um, itself, the uh, recommended budget that came from the county executive is a very small increase of less than 1.4% under $200,000, um, keeping the organization pretty flat. And um, we did have the opportunity to do a final um, check-in and um, learned um, through some of the tracking that our IT organization has done that there has been an phenomenal increase in the amount of constituent services council members are providing. And I probably don't need to tell this to you because you're experiencing it, um, but just tracking um, correspondence coming in alone, a six-fold increase from um, 2011 to 2020. Um, it's, it's just been really amazing. So what we've suggested, given you know, current fiscal situations, is a modest $40,000 increase to each council member's office, um, probably the equivalent of getting a part-time staff or maybe taking an existing part-time staff member, um, making them full-time. So it's not even enough for a full position, uh, but we do think that it's, it's really critical to provide some additional support uh, for these offices. You know, I've spoken to your your staff, they, they're they all really overworked and this pandemic has made that even worse. And hopefully this will provide a little bit of assistance there. Um, the second increase I'm, I'm recommending is that um, the council offices undertook the initiation of some equity and inclusion training. We took a first step limited just to the council offices. Um, this is a first step and one we think we need to continue over the next year also with the intent of expanding it to the rest of the legislative branch. And I will note that the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice um, has its own training, but we believe these are very different, they have different focuses. Um, nonetheless, we will work with them to make sure that it is coordinated. And um, this is a contractual effort. I will note also that I think it's really critical um, given that we're gonna have a turnover in um, council for us to you know, come up with a strategy on how we are going to continue um, to provide this training to new um, new council members and their staffs as well, hopefully by that point on an in-house basis. But we want to position ourselves to be able to make that tr uh, transition as successful as possible. Um, so those are the two recommendations for the council office budget. Any comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Katz and Clinton. I know just a very quick thank you to 
you you said it all uh, 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 chair um, um, but just a quick thank you to Ms. Michelson and and everyone else who worked on this uh, on this budget I, I I have to tell you I think of all the emails I get. I get more from Sandra Marin than anybody else. Uh -huh. I mean, we, uh, she has to work. And twenty four seven is not. I, you know, I always tease people they work twenty five eight. You have to work twenty five nine. I mean, it is constant that we that we get them. They're on time. They're always. I mean, you're you're obviously do a wonderful job. So we sincerely thank you. And and I think all of this is very necessary. You know, one of the things one of the things that COVID showed us is that we all need to continue to work 25 8 we need to we need to have as many uh we need as much uh, assistance as we can possibly get so i think this is a sensible realistic way to to approach this thank you okay um i don't see any other comments so um without objection i think that we will approve uh, this recommended budget and again uh, expressing our utmost appreciation to staff who's had to deal with, you know, personal um, health issues, you know, family related issues while helping all of us do our work to respond to the many issues that this pandemic has brought. I, I don't think that there is a way to quantify uh, the impact, the stress, the trauma, the added emotional and mental um, burden on our staff, and by that I also want to, you know, make sure that I'm talking about our central office staff, our minute, you know, our, our administrative assistants, everybody, as well as our council office staff. But you know, we do this because we care about the work, we care about public service, we care about making sure that we do everything possible for our constituents, our residents, and you know, as we're a little bit. I think celebratory, a little bit confident in the numbers that we are seeing coming um, out of, you know, the daily reports on cases and things of that nature and the number of vaccines to the percentage of the residents that have received at least their first dose, et cetera. A lot of that is thanks to everyone banding together and putting forth their best possible self. So I, I just sincerely appreciate it because I know how tough, how tough it's been. So thank you all. Okay, so with that, let's move right on to the uh, item seven, which is the Legislative Branch Communications NDA. And uh, for this item, uh, of course, we have Ms. Healy, um, who has been extraordinary in uh, leading us through this pandemic in terms of communication responses, um, just about everything, because this pandemic has been, in my opinion, predicated on making sure that we have the appropriate um, communication in place that it's clear and that people know exactly what is happening. And she has led her team uh, through amazing, amazing and very difficult times. So Ms. Healy, I very much thank you for everything that you have done to keep us straight and keep our county residents uh, informed. And um, that has not been an easy task. Uh, and of course, Ms. Marin is here um, as well. And, and Ms. Brockington continues to, to be here also. I. Um, I just wanted to also very quickly uh, point out that this NDA, uh, and I've asked my staff to make sure that we include this in the packet that goes to full council, because it's, it's important to understand the history here. Um, you know, this has been really a, a work in progress. And uh, it was 2011 um, when we started working on establishing some enhancements to our communications office. It began then with a part-time contractual position for Spanish language communication. Uh, in 2012, that was expanded to two-thirds, uh, you know, position. In 2013, then we decided to strengthen a lot of this, uh, and uh, we created a full-time council, bilingual, bicultural, um, PIO, and the Council Communications Office. Uh, we also invested in a weekly uh, council Spanish language program in, in, in radio, which was Radio America. We started the closed captioning during council hearings so that if we had residents that came to testify in a different language than English, that there would be subtitles on the screens in English. This is, this is 2013 that we're talking about. 2014, we 
expanded some of that um, to include part-time contract support for outreach efforts with the Korean, Chinese, and Vietnamese uh, communities. Also, we recruited three part-time contractors to strengthen communications outreach, a video editor, videographer, a second multilingual specialist, to expand the outreach to our Korean, Chinese, and Vietnamese communities. In 2015, we also began to do some work with uh, Linea Directa, which is a um, program that shows on Telemundo, and also with uh, CCM in terms of uh, related county issues. And so this, again, goes way back. And, um, you know, I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. In 2008 is when MCPS established the translation unit. Um, and, and that was something that I was very involved in and have been working on for a while. But the reason I mention all of this is because these kinds of systemic and structural changes are so necessary. We just had that conversation with the executive item on uh, their translation unit. It is so critical that the council also enhance their capacity um, because our work uh, it is very unique in, in many ways. Um, and it is not easy to be able to communicate with, you know, your average resident that maybe does watch this, you know, and, and pays attention to what we're doing. But imagine all of the residents that are not always watching what we're doing, that are not necessarily, um, you know, involved and engaged. Uh, it is our job to constantly meet all of our residents where they are. And, I, you know, once again, we'll say that it, when it comes to serving our very diverse communities, this is pivotal. I mean, we're making decisions that affect their lives and to not have the capacity to be able to respond, to be able to, um, you know, inform, to be able to give sometimes life-saving information, um, in my opinion, means that we're falling short of our duty. So um, I know that there are, there's a set of recommendations here uh, that I believe literally just, you know, continues to expand in a very conservative fashion what we all started back in 2012. Uh, this pandemic, once again, has arrived to give us a very, very startling wake-up call regarding what our um, service delivery models and our best practices, what that should look like. Uh, and I will also be, you know, very blunt. Um, I have problems whenever we seem to vacillate when it comes to investing, especially in, in reaching our immigrant communities or our communities of color, um, as if we're still dealing with these communities like they just got here, we just discovered that they are here. If MCPS demographics and Montgomery College demographic is any illustration of what the 20, you know, 20 census is going to show, 73% of color MCPS, 78% of color Montgomery College students, then we need to own the fact that we are way behind when it comes to serving uh, what is obviously the majority of our county residents. And so to me, strengthening these areas um, should not even be a question. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe that we've been very slow at doing it. I understand that we have to be fiscally, you know, responsible in many ways, but I think that this particular proposal, it's going to really help a council that in 2022 will expand um, and will require even more um, you know, of these types of systemic and structural uh, um, responses. Uh, so, you know, so again, thanks to the team who's done extraordinary work. Um, and I will all, you know, I also have to thank our council staff because I know in my office, you know, Sosimo, I know that in many other offices, they will drop whatever they need to drop in order to fill in the gap. But you know what? That's not their job because then they also have to do constituent services for the for the office and things like that, they should not have to do what what, what should be um, central, you know, office work. Um, but they've done it, and they do it because once again, they they love their their job and they feel very strongly. So I have to give them all a shout out for having stepped up along with everybody else. Um, so with, with that, um, I don't know if uh, it's Ms. Helium, Ms. Michelson that wants to walk us through some of the proposals, and then of course we'll open it up to my colleagues for questions and and um, and then we will take a vote. Right. 
Um, you want to thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll lead off and ask um, Ms. Healy to jump in if, at any point if there's something she wants to add. Um, the uh, executive's recommended budget for um, the Legislative Branch Communications Outreach NDA is close to $1.2 million. Um, and we are recommending that the council consider certain additions to this budget at this time. Uh, they're all revolving around multicultural communications and also crisis management. And if you'll um, allow me to tell you a quick story, um, when I started at the council, we had Wang computers and there was one per computer per two analysts. Um, we, it was on a cart and we'd wheel it back and forth to each other when we wanted to use it, which was kind of ridiculous. At that time, all of the technology services was um, focused in the executive branch. Um, we had one person here monitoring our servers, but not providing any support. And over time, we realized that not only did everyone need their own personal computer, but the council really needed its own IT unit to guide it. Um, here as well. Um, and we've got a, a, a fabulous group of, uh, of individuals working on IT issues for us. I think a little bit about um, that when I thought about how we've dealt with outreach um, and, and multicultural outreach in particular, that at one point it was centralized in the executive branch but this has become such a critical part of what we do that saying that it should only be in the executive branch is not serving us well. And we feel that we need to expand um, the council's capacity to do that. The other thing I wanted to notice is we have been doing multicultural communication, but the way we've been doing it is borrowing time from people who have other job descriptions. Um, so we do have a multicultural communication team the members all have other jobs. No one is thinking about that 100%. It's hard to be strategic. It's hard to have a good plan. Um, similarly, on translation, um, we don't have in-house translation capacity. So um, as the chair noted, we have been fortunate that staff um, working in her office and other offices have stepped up to do that. And it is really not fair to them. Um, we, there are some translation capacities in the executive branch. We found that to be, you know, slow, not responsive, uh, problems with quality. And we think that the best way to deal with that would be to have um, an in-house um, translator who could help turn things around and ensure that quality control. So um, we are recommending a multicultural communications and community outreach manager, someone who will do develop a strategic plan for this and will, um, you know, it, it, we very well could come back to you and say, we need more resources to do this, but we think the first step is to be strategic, have someone full-time doing this, develop a plan, um, including how we will interact with executive staff working on this. Um, the other really critical um, position here that I've mentioned is having a full-time translator and interpreter so that we don't have to draw from other offices. Um, two other things that um, we think are, are important, maybe a little bit less critical, um, is to have a bilingual uh, videographer who can work with our staff that's um, developing um, Spanish language uh, videos um, and to have somebody um, working with her as a, on a contractual basis who can um, speak Spanish. And then um, finally, uh, software solutions so that we can broadcast council meetings in multiple languages. Um, we started investigating what is on the market, the easy options, the Google Translate, um, and we're just not convinced that that's the best tool. So we'd really like to look at whether there are better options. It would be really wonderful if every time the council broadcasts, people would have a choice of having translation into multiple languages. And, and we don't quite know the amount, so we're suggesting a $30,000 placeholder, would, which would let us investigate this and do that uh, and, and, and figure out how we move ahead. Um, finally, the, and moving to the other area where we think that um, some additional consulting services would be helpful is in the area of crisis management. And um, you know, we feel like there's been a 24 hour news cycle here. It doesn't stop. Um, a lot of times we have crises and we have to figure out 
how we can best communicate with our public to let them know what, what to do, what the county is doing, what the next steps are. This has put an enormous burden on our communications office to try to do this. Um, and I really think it has overburdened them. So bringing in some consulting assistance really focused on this sort of crisis management issue, um, I think would serve our residents well, would serve the council well, um, and would keep Ms. Healy from deciding she really needs to like quit her job, which, and that's, that's my biggest, you know, um, goal here is to make sure that we're not wearing her out so much that um, she decides she can't take it anymore because I don't know what we would do without her. Um, so these are the areas where I feel that we have real gaps in, in our needs and um, um, making these recommendations to strengthen what we do. I will notice note on the crisis management, um, since so much of that is linked to what we've been doing uh, during the pandemic that, you know, the, the committee may want to consider whether that's an ARPA funding, which would just be a temporary um, time period to get us through the crisis. And then um, we would have to reassess at the end of that, whether the assistance provided on crisis management was so critical that it should be done on an ongoing basis rather than just temporarily um, as we wrap up, um, hopefully wrap up uh, our dealing with pandemic issues. So I'll, I'll stop there. And um, uh, Ms. Healy, do you have anything you wanted to add before we turn it over to questions? Uh, I just wanted to make a few comments. And the first is being, um, you know, the chairwoman hit it right on the head. And I really want to express my appreciation to you, Chair Navarro, because you were the original architect of a holistic communications model at the council which has been able for us to do this work and to support us year after year. And I greatly appreciate that, as well as the support from everyone on the committee. Um, this entire year, you've all pitched in to help us. You've given of your staff, you've given of yourselves um, to get us through this crisis this year. And I also want to recognize the members of our team because it's been a total group effort. Everyone on the communication staff stepped up to the plate, um, did what they need to do outside of their comfort zone and outside of normal working hours and never complained and jumped in and did it. So I really want to uh, recognize every member of my team um, who's done an amazing job. And it's it's been because of your leadership that we've been able to put this team together and to really step it up this year. So I just want to express my appreciation to all of you and to my team. Thank you, Ms. Healy. I also, you know, again, uh, you, you've been a great leader. Um, and the only thing I will say before I turn to my colleagues is that I don't view, you know, this investment as sort of like only for, you know, it's not about working in silos again, right? So it should be kind of interwoven in everything that we do. So that if we are going to be engaged in a land use decision about a master plan and we're out there in the community that this is this is integrated you know if we are going to have a town hall for example um that all of this support is integrated so that when we're doing our communication our engagement our outreach we're not trying to separate it as if you know this is what we'll do with spanish-speaking people or this is, no that is all part of this integrated approach and that everybody can feel like doesn't matter how maybe intimidating it might be to try to, you know, get involved uh, and participate because, hey, we have made it so that you can feel comfortable and that you can find the information and that you can find the engagement um, to, to be productive. And, and that's what we're trying to do. So sometimes I feel like we get stuck on thinking that this is only multicultural. It's, it really is just interwoven in everything that, that, that we do. Um, so anyway, so um, let's see, Councilmember Katz. Thank you. And you know, I I think I was up to twenty six nine uh, twenty five twenty six nine for uh, Sandra Marin. I think some you you and your group are like twenty seven ten or eleven something like that. You, you really are unbelievable. And and I do want to echo what what Marlene said. We you know. If you get so frustrated that you think that today is not the day for you, let us all know. You communicate well. Let us all know. And and we'll figure out something here. I mean, you know, all days are, are not horrible. It's it's just that we have to figure out how to how to make them better. 
Um, but I, I agree. I think we need to, to uh, enhance the way it's being suggested. And I also agree with the uh, chair. I, I know I'm getting a feedback. I don't know if others are getting it, but I, I, um, I also agree with the chair that this is a system that needs, I used to, I always like to talk about the puzzle. The puzzle needs to fit together. Communication is a puzzle and it needs to fit together so that every person who is, who we are trying to reach gets the, the information that we know is so very necessary for each person to get. And you all do a wonderful job and we need to give you the resources to continue to do that wonderful job, even in a more enhanced way. So thank you very, very much. And I appreciate all the, st the staff suggestions. Thank you. Councilor Rapitzen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, just echoing comments that have been made. Uh, thank you to the staff. This has been an unprecedented year. Uh, we've been asked to do things in county government and at the county council that nobody would have anticipated the other duties as assigned category uh, has far surpassed uh, what anybody signed up for, what anybody has in their job description. And uh, we owe everybody a, a, a debt of gratitude. I mean, this really has been uh, the essence of uh, servants and public service. And I really do appreciate that. There, there are no more hours uh, to work. Uh, you know, I don't do math as well as uh, Councilmember Katz does. So I won't attempt to dictate uh, the way that uh, days and hours work. Uh, uh, that is beyond my uh, mere uh, mortality. But, um, it, it, you know, it, it has created a challenge and the stress that that has created, the challenges that that has created, uh, you know, it, it makes it harder for us to do our job, which is to serve the community. And so uh, I appreciate that. I will echo the, the comments about uh, Chair Navarro and, and, and your efforts, I will say that uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, this was an issue that uh, you raised in the very first briefing that we had and continued uh, to raise uh, this challenge. It's not really a council issue, although we are definitely a part of it. We've been talking about uh, the capacity of the legislative branch of a government of our size and scope for a while. Uh, but uh, in terms of our outreach and the way that our government communicates with its residents and uh, the type of residents we have and the type of communication that they require uh, and the amount of uh, cultural competency and language proficiency that we are capable of uh, doing at every level of government, legislative, executive, uh, and beyond. And it hasn't caught up uh, to uh, the, the population that we are tasked uh, with serving. I, I take very seriously this, this role. Uh, these are not our seats. Uh, these are the seats that belong to the public, uh, that we have the privilege and honor of very temporarily occupying for four, eight, or 12 years. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that's uh, really important. And certainly in the four, eight, and 12 years that each of us are uh, approaching to serve, and, and only Councilmember Navarra will uh, be able to say more than 12 uh, years in the history of uh, the County Council. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the county has changed and, and, and will continue to change. And so uh, I really do appreciate uh, that leadership that has, has been shown. Uh, so I, I am very supportive of all of the efforts uh, uh, included in here uh, to address the, the cultural competency, language proficiency, uh, and the type of uh, outreach that we need to have to communicate the issues that we are working on and to hear from the residents who they impact, uh, and in many cases impact the most. Uh, and so I, I, I uh, am very supportive of that. I think that it's an investment that's worth doing. I will say that it's very important that we understand how it works together with what the executive branch is or isn't doing. I, I think we have found some real gaps uh, in uh, these efforts. And I just wanna make sure that we're not, uh, you know, moving forward in a way that addresses the current gaps and aren't focused on the broader needs and, and are not focused on this current council or this current executive or this current moment, uh, but are really thought through strategically and comprehensively uh, as a uh, county council that uh, is uh, changing in terms of what the expectations of our residents are and a population uh, that is changing based on what its composition and what its needs are. And I just, you know, I don't think we're there yet. I think this is in the early stages. You have to provide the 
the funding before you can ensure that it is being uh, put to use in the best possible way. But I just wanted to put that marker down. This committee in particular, Chair Navarro uh, especially, have really focused on being strategic, being comprehensive, connecting the dots. We've been talking quite a bit about that in other areas. And so, you know, hopefully when this is better flushed out, uh, 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 flushed out, excuse me, after the, uh, the the budget process, we could really, you know, get a briefing on specifically how this is going to work, how the uh, issues that we dealt with earlier in the executive branch and filling some of those gaps or working together with, with, with these. I, I don't think that one in one direction and the other in another direction with the siloed approach that uh, I was listening in on uh, Council Member Navarro, Chair Navarro, uh, noting earlier, uh, it, you know, will work. And I think particularly here, county residents, as Council Member Katz was talking about, don't care who the branch of government is uh, that is responding to them. It's the county government. It's the folks who are, uh, uh, you know, whose salaries they're paying uh, to provide them with services that they need. And so I uh, just hope that we can uh, address that. The only thing that I will say is I, I think on the crisis communications piece, at least for me, I think my sense is I, I, I'm that's a little premature for me. I think by the time we put together the crisis communications proposal, we will be through this crisis. And I think it may make sense to really think through what what that means. I, mean, I, I have previously run a communications office at a large state agency as, as, as part of my role, crisis communications was certainly central uh, to that job. Uh, but thinking through having a consultant, having the consultant be providing uh, training and other things to individual council members, I just am a little uneasy uh, about that. I think the whole challenge that we have in crisis communications is eliminating the silo, is making sure that we're speaking with one voice of the county government, I think that has been a challenge for us throughout this pandemic, you know, as a council, uh, as an executive branch, individual departments. Uh, I think we got to sort through some of that once we get a chance to catch our breath and then think through how to move forward, at least from my uh, perspective. I also do think that as we work out some of these other issues, it will free us up to better address the crisis in the moment. Uh, you know, I think, you know, some of it is, uh, you know, as we were talking about when you're repurposing folks from doing their standard job to have to do other jobs, it, it doesn't allow for the type of strategic thought and proactive uh, efforts uh, that, that that we all would hope. So um, I'll just leave it that where, where I'm at personally uh, is uh, I am very comfortable, very happy and uh, feel very strongly about uh, building on the work uh, that has been done. Uh, in terms of uh, outreach and representing the, uh, the the changing community that we have and the uh, new needs that we face. Uh, but on the crisis uh, communications RFP, at least from my personal perspective, I, I think we're not quite ready for that, although I do think that it's something that should be discussed and we should work through it, although I, I don't think that it's a council issue. I think that is a county government question, and we ought to have as part of the long-term strategic conversation, uh, a decision of, you know, how that's done, where it's done, uh, what's the best way to move forward uh, on that. So that, that's, that, 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 that's my general thinking there. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman Rafitsen. I am um, listening to you. It occurs to me that perhaps one of the areas that we uh, should be looking at is um, the area of professional development for our communications um, team in the subject of, you know, crisis management, communication, or things of that nature, um, so that, you know, instead of focusing on contracting, because as you were saying, I feel like we're kind of like, hopefully, hopefully, we're <laughs> nearing the other end. Um, but I do believe that there are particular, a particular um you know, nuances and, uh, you know, just general practices that had to go with crisis management, which I feel like we literally are doing crisis management every day. I mean, every day there is something that, you know, comes up that is broader than just, of course, the, you know, the pandemic. Um, so, 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 you know, 
I don't know. I, I feel like maybe we can think about how we could address that piece and then just strengthen the capacity of our communications office to have almost like a set of protocols and, and you know, guidelines vis-a-vis -vis how you manage particular, you know, crises that, that affect us um, generally. You know, what is it that we can discuss? How quick, you know, what are sort of the protocols in place? Um, I don't, I don't know, you know, if it's something that we can then come back to with, you know, additional dollars, et cetera, because I know that, as Michael said, you had said that the crisis management RFP, you were thinking maybe could be through ARPA, um, but that would be something broader. So I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on, you know, how we could strengthen that. Um, but it occurs to me that I, I think that the area of professional development is one that we need to pay a little bit more close attention, you know, to. So it's not just hiring folks, but then also prepping everybody with the tools to meet this ongoing, rapidly changing landscape of communications. Um, just a thought there, Ms. Michelson. Don't know if you have any. I do, I do think that um, particularly, you know, if we bring in a multicultural manager, which kind of frees other staff people's time, um, that what we can do is, um, as you suggested, Karen Navarro, look at training options. Um, and try and see what we can do with the existing staff to give them additional capacity to do this without going a contractual route, but doing professional development. And then, you know, if that doesn't seem to be enough, we'll come back to you and let you know. Okay. Does that sound satisfactory to colleagues, Councilor Friedson? Yeah, well, I think it's a great idea. And I, I do think that, you know, ultimately we need to be in a position to respond to crises. In fact, we're seeing them more and more as you no, maybe it's not going to be a global pandemic, we hope, for at least another century. Uh, but, uh, you know, th th there will, will be more and more uh, crises that we need to develop. And I, I do think uh, training the team and equipping the team uh, to, to, to do that and allow, you know, putting them in a position to succeed by having the appropriate staff complement on the executive branch and the, the, the legislative uh, branch. Uh, you know, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'd be more comfortable with that approach. I, I think the consultancy here is the area where, you know, maybe during a global pandemic, that's an appropriate thing to do. But once we get out of that, you know, I'm, I wasn't sure that that was the right approach, although I appreciated the thought process. I think what you have suggested here of, you know, thinking through, and I think we'll have time to do it. Uh, you know, to your point, we all hope that, um, you know, once we get out of this pandemic, we want to be thinking through like you and uh, and and Councilmember Katz had, had raised in case we have another uh, issue, so that we are uh, prepared in advance for it. And you know, I think having staff prepared uh, for it and having a team uh, ready for it is a is a better long term approach than hiring a consultant with a roadmap to you know to to, to help the council members. Because again, we are temporary, uh, and and I think we should treat it as you know each of us as a council member. I was only here for a temporary period of time. It's you know, creating and developing a professional network of a, of a team and a staff that really, uh, you know, allows it, uh, you know, so that, you know, the, the institution uh, can serve the community uh, and the council members are, 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 are uh, you know, frankly, come and go. And so I think it's a really good suggestion. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so, um... The last thing I will say um, also to you, Councilor Friedson, I know in the previous items when we were discussing, you know, 311 and uh, the community partnerships and things like that, we did say that we're going to come back um, to have a fuller conversation about how all of this aligns, right? So all this money that we're investing in outreach and communications, et cetera, both on the county executive side, but also as we're strengthening, you know, the council's. I, I would like to have a robust session to discuss almost like, you know, rules of engagement. Um, how can, how are we going to leverage, you know, our capacities? How can we work together? Um, you know, can you please give us information that is timely? You know, all of these things. I, I, at the end of the day, as you were saying, you know, people think of one county government. Um, the, the bottom line is that we have got to make sure that we're understanding how everything is interacting. And I know Dr. Torreda said that, you know, he, he had identified some really good sort of next steps. And so, um, so Ms. Michaels, and I think that, you know, for central staff, I think if we could schedule something perhaps um, maybe in the middle of summer, just to kind of bring, you know, MC311 community 
you know, the community partnerships, you know, all of these efforts together, the PIO, um, to have kind of like a roadmap for establishing rules of engagement. Um, because the last thing we want is what we did experience, especially during the crises, you know, where we wouldn't have accurate information or timely information or, you know, that's your job to translate. You know, that's your job to translate. And, uh, you know, we can't do that. It's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so, so anyway, I, I think that it would be awesome if, if we could do something, something of that. That nature. I could mention in my earlier comments, Madam Chair, that I hope that we have more council members who are capable of doing translations moving forward, but I hope that we don't need council members to do translations moving forward because I know uh, you have spent more time uh, than, than uh, should have occurred translating press releases and uh, other uh, official uh, documents of the government. We're lucky to have that, but, and I hope we have more of it uh, moving forward for a lot of different reasons, uh, but certainly we should have uh, a government that's set up where uh, council members uh, are not uh, being asked uh, or, or being in a position where they need to do that. So I think this is yeah. a step forward to avoiding that. And thanks for stepping in uh, where the gap no, occurred during the crisis. You, no, I mean, it, 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 of course, I feel like it's my responsibility, but I do, I, do, I am sensitive to the notion that it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we all do what we need to do. Uh, but yeah, it is about structures and it is about, you know, the institution. And as you said, we're just here temporarily. So whatever we can do to, to strengthen that, I think it's, it's, it's the way to go. Okay. So I think what I'm hearing is that we will, um, we will adopt uh, without objection the county executive's recommendation of the 1,080,342. And in addition, we will then, um, and Ms. Michelson, I guess you can help me out here of like yeah, where is this going to go. At the bottom of page two of the memo lists the, the different additions, the multicultural communications and community outreach manager, bilingual videographer, contractor, software solutions and equipment for broadcasting in multiple languages and a full-time translator. And we will hold on the crisis management consulting firm, but look for opportunities for professional development that can strengthen our staff. Well, I think that sounds about right. Without objection? Okay, great. Thank well, you. thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so moving right along, item eight. Let me go back to my notes. Okay. Um, I did um, move to a different area of the house so that the doggies wouldn't follow me, but they did. So I, I apologize say it didn't if you work. Hear. Madam Chair, it, it didn't work. <laughs> it, it didn't work at all. And my daughter had to go out. And so, you know, he's very small. He's only four pounds. But he's very loud. <laughs> Our public elections fund, uh, we are uh, coming back to this item. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to uh, sort out before taking final action on this item was the issue of the um, staff, the positions that would be dedicated to uh, this particular piece. Um, because, of course, as, as you recall, we had a lot of conversation about, you know, we had the trial run of this program. It was very successful, but it was also very taxing on Mr. Crow and everybody who was trying to figure out a lot of the questions um, and get the answers. And so one of the things we did was to come back uh, and list the feedback from people who had participated, et cetera. And um, there were surveys, you know, there was just a lot of robust feedback. And one of the things we did was to amend the bill. Um, and one of the things it asked for is that the county executive should either hire positions or designate a position that would be dedicated um, to troubleshooting and to giving the appropriate information, et cetera, provide guidance because it can be really stressful when you're trying to figure all of this out. Um, and so we didn't have clarity when we took this item of the first time, but we're back. And um, Mr. Mia, why don't you take it away and tell us uh, what is the uh, what was the resolution for this, and then we can uh, quickly take a vote. Uh, so, so since we last met, the CAO uh, agreed to send over a budget amendment, um, which actually arrived a few minutes ago. Um, and what it does is um, it's requesting 1.5 FTEs to be added to the Office of Consumer Protection. 
uh, to uh, A, uh, one FT to, um, for a grade 23 program manager position to serve as the full-time public liaison position. And it would also um, add another half FTE to um, one, uh, it would fully fund a vacant, a currently vacant part-time administrative specialist position in OCP. And two, it would um, exp- convert it to a full-time position to provide additional uh, support to the public liaison position. Um, because there's a need for the public liaison position um, today, the um, department has agreed to um, um, name a temporary public liaison who would begin to uh, fulfill that function um, today and would begin to transition knowledge from uh, Mr. David Crow uh, on the program. And so uh, just to note that um, the Public Safety Committee last week did vote uh, by consent on the uh, consumer protection budget. Uh, I did not get a chance to review these changes, but uh, the full council will have a chance to review and, and do a straw vote on the on the 17th on OCP's budget. Um, so this is um, fairly late breaking information, but this is the plan that the executive has proposed um, and staff, council staff um, does support this plan. Um, I will also note that um, the CE's budget for March 15th originally included $23,000 for finance for contractor support. Because of these new resources being added to OCP's budget, uh, that request has been revised down to $150,000, uh, primarily for a, um, a admin uh, support person to help Mr. Crow uh, administer the funds, track um, and monitor disbursements, uh, track receipts, and interface with the, with the state um, IT systems. Um, and there's also some dollars in 150000 uh, for a potential uh, IT license or IT support um, that may be needed, um, but it's not, it's not known, it's not confirmed if that's needed yet. Um, also, so, so those are the staffing pieces um, uh, related to the elections fund. I will stop there and uh, answer any questions, and department staff is available to provide more details. So how would this be communicated to candidates, et cetera, in terms of like, who is the, you know, who's the staff person? How do they contact the person? All of those details. How would that be communicated? Because I know people are already asking. I believe there will be a press release once, um, I mean, I, I'm assuming it's official now that we're uh, funding this. So I believe a press release will go out and then um, we will have something on the program website, which will link over to OCP and have the contact information and then um, develop it from there. Great, because that would be critical. I know that's going to be the very first question people are going to start asking. So it'd be awesome to have that, you know, once, of course, everything is approved. Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Uh, Someone just explain to me the one and a half positions. I didn't quite understand. You know, there was a question of identifying a position in the county government. We didn't need to create a position for that based on the legislation, but there was an interest to do that, particularly when it was selected to put it in the Office of Consumer Protection. I think all of us were sensitive to an office that is asked to do a lot and is not provided a lot of resources to do it. Now, that wasn't our decision. That was the executive decision. I respect and appreciate the sensitivity of, uh, you know, a unique uh, circumstance that may not be so unique moving forward, which is uh, an incumbent county executive participating in the program and wanting to have, you know, some separation uh, as appropriate uh, for the liaison to a campaign uh, for that particular county executive. So I, I, I understand that. I, I think that you know, it was a reasonable approach, but I didn't quite understand going from part-time to full-time for an additional position plus the liaison. Are there going to be two people, somebody part-time working on the liaison work for this and somebody full-time working on the liaison work for this? Or is, is, is am I not understanding what the proposal before us is? So, so the proposal is um, there's currently a half FT part-time admin specialist that's currently vacant and unfunded. Um, in OCP as of today, the proposal will be to to reactivate that position and to make it a full time position, so that part of the position's duties would support the public liaison, and the remaining part would would provide general admin support to OCP. Um, and that position, has to, I, I don't know, Dr. Friedman, how long that position is vacant, but I believe that's a resource that's that's needed to assist the department. 
Yes, that's a, a part-time position. So, uh, Council Member Friedson, what this would be doing would be creating one new position and then turning uh, a part-time position that's been vacant for a while into a full-time one, which would uh, provide assistance to uh, to the new full-time position, but would also reflect the fact that this is, to some extent, seasonal work um, so that the assistance may not be required full-time. And if I could also just introduce um, our manager, our operations manager, Samuel Buo, um, who's actually going to be, he's on the call now, of course, and he's also going to be carrying the, the weight of this work uh, during the remainder of FY21. So what we will be doing is during the remainder of FY21, uh, carrying this without any further resources, because the resources that were being discussed right now don't kick in until July 1. Um, so uh, it's, it's basically just one new position with a part-time uh, assistant. I totally appreciate it. Listen, if, if, if the question is, does the Office of Consumer Protection need more support? I would answer yes. I think that you have uh, been stretched very thin and have taken the brunt of uh, cuts and, and, and other things that have not come back uh, to, uh, uh, you know, capacity. There's more fraud now with, uh, you know, this pandemic, uh, you know, perhaps than ever. Uh, before, and, and I think your call volume is, I'm sure, going up because we're getting a lot of the concerns and questions uh, that we're forwarding to you. And I'm just one of nine council members, and so I, I know that you're answering more phone calls than just mine, even though you're a neighbor of mine. So maybe, you know, uh, and I get to be your council member, Mr. Friedman. So, uh, but um, I just want to make sure the, the my, my, my thought of a liaison position is that the liaison would be receiving the phone calls and answering the emails themselves. And so I just want to make sure that there's not like an intake person. And then, you know, like, you know, my idea is that there'd be a direct point of contact in the executive branch who can quickly, responsibly uh, address uh, questions and concerns. I just want to make sure that we're not creating a high level of bureaucracy here to be able to respond to campaign questions, which they need, you know, sometimes pretty quick turnaround on. That, that's, that's my only concern. If the issue is there's some administrative issues and the office already doesn't have the ability to handle them, you know, fine, let's, 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 let's deal with that. I think there's a lot of sympathy on this committee for the concerns of the office and, the, you know, it's being stretched too thin, but I, I still don't quite understand the half position. There's no position now. You're being asked to add a position that is unrelated to your normal work, which you're taking on. And now we're going to fund the half position that is unfunded and the additional and an additional half position. There will be one new position, and that position will be the point of contact. There's no question about it. Uh, this is going to be the direct uh, contact person. It's going to leave David Crow and, and finance able to do all the vetting and work that they are, are going to be responsible for doing. So there's there's no question about that. Um, and we'll be very clear that uh, the public, uh, people running for office, uh, can have uh, one point of contact, as I think was uh, the plan that uh, the committee chair Navarro had, had envisioned when this was uh, created. So regardless of what you call it, whether it's called a liaison, a gatekeeper, a point person, an ombudsman, uh, a public facing contact, we will have that. We'll have that in our office. And you uh, can rest assured that customer service is the middle name of our office and has been that uh, our middle name for the last uh, 50 years um, that we are soon to be celebrating our 50th anniversary at the end of this year. And it's probably fitting that this uh, new responsibility is being added to our um, uh, portfolio. Um, and if we will even be able to uh, take this new responsibility on from day one, even though you know we're certainly not subject matter experts, but Samuel Buo, our operations manager, uh, will be that person uh, starting uh, whenever the second is that this begins. Um, and then we will be um, having someone come aboard uh, by hopefully July 1 when, when the, the funding kicks in uh, and we will 
uh, work on this role as, as best we can. Um, and uh, I think we understand, and the more clarity, the better that comes from the committee in terms of what they're looking for. Uh, but I think we, we have a pretty good sense of what that is. Thank you. Councilor Marquette. Thank you very much. I think it should be pointed out that we have uh, Mr. Friedman and Mr. Fried's son. Um, so we have man and son won this call. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so between them, between them, we certainly will get all this straightened out. Um, I, I, I have always said, Eric, and I mean this sincerely, and, and Mr. Uh, Buo, we, we appreciate all of your help as well and everybody else on, from uh, uh, consumer protection, but, but um, I, I believe that we need to um, start advertising for this position so on July 1, when the money is available, the person can actually start. Because as we know, and, and um, Mr. Buwal, I don't know you well enough to tease you, but I like teasing everybody. Uh, you all have, and I would tease you to say you don't have enough to do, but I know you do. So. But, but candidly, this is not fair to have them do all of this extra work without having the extra help. So if it's possible, and I don't know the, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of how you would do it, but I believe that we should approve this and we should approve this saying that they get to advertise for this position and on July 1 or that, that the person could, so that the person could start that quickly. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I echo that. I mean, so however, Mr. Mia, you can sort of relay this um, as well in terms of the intent of the committee. I um, I also believe that, you know, the kickoff of this program um, was very ambitious and it just coincided with the fact that we had term limits uh, and we know what happened, right? 30 something people running, I think it was, I forgot how many, but a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I know Mr. Crow and Mr. You know, the Mariners, everybody just really stepped up. But it was it was not easy. Uh, and uh, it was, though, I think, super, um, super important. Right. Other jurisdictions have emulated what we did here. And one of the things we understood was, yes, we're going to need more capacity to make sure that, you know, everything goes uh, to plan and that everybody has the information. And lo and behold, 2022, there'll be two additional seats open seats. So who knows, you know, how many people are going to actually run. Uh, and of course, they're going to be, you know, three term limited council members. Uh, so therefore, you know, we, uh, we know we can anticipate that this is going to be a very active um, cycle. And so I, 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 you know, I feel pretty good about this proposal. I do believe that, yes, the minute, you know, as soon as possible, these things need to get advertised. Really appreciate Mr. Bull stepping up to this plate. I'm sure Mr. Crow is going to be like, you know, doing a little dance or something like that. Um, but I'm sure he will be able to uh, instruct you and, and orient you and all the nuts and bolts. I have to say that, you know, I already have people to have asked me for information and I'm sending over links to the website and, and the graphics that, you know, were put together who were really, really the infographics were really useful. That's going to start happening uh, as well. So, um, so anyhow, I, I you know, I, I feel comfortable with this proposal. Um, and um, unless there's any objection from colleagues, uh, I think that we should, you know, go ahead and adopt this uh, along with the recommendation of the executive for the $3 million. If everybody's kind of okay with that. The doc, uh, Councilmember Pizza, he's sort of okay. No, but... no objection. I was just trying okay. to <laughs> All right. All right, uh, Mr. Mia, you have you have uh, the in, the uh, intent of the uh, committee, the decision of the committee, all figured yes. out. Yes, I do. You know what we want. Okay, awesome. Yes, well, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Friedman, Mr. Crow, Mr. Bull, and this uh, Bernard de Gomez. Thank you so much um, for um, the information. I'm glad we were able to sort it out. All right, our next item is property tax options rate amount and the income tax off. Set credit, and for that we have Mr. Gene Smith, and we're just going to jump right into it, Mr. Smith. Turn it over to you. All right, very good. Thank you, Ms. Navarro, and I'm also joined by my colleagues from finance, Mr. W, uh, Mr. Platt, and um, yeah, sorry, apologies. 
um, and Ms. Feldman. Um, and Welcome. so we'll go ahead and, and given the time, uh, we'll be fairly quick. So each year the council considers its options as it relates to property taxes, um, including the income tax offset credit. As noted in this council staff report, um, due to the charter amendment that occurred in November 2020, uh, the council's process is simplified this year. There's not a lot of different permutations that the council staff needed to do unless council members uh, wanted to explore those and none we're going to explore this year um, based on council president's approach to the fiscal 22 budget. Um, and we'll and thank so council member Friedson for that. Thank you for simplifying things, council member Friedson. Indeed. Um, and so the executive has um, has made recommendations, council staff notes those, and we'll go through both of them real quick. So for the income tax offset credit, um, this is a, a credit that's provided to resident homeowners in the county um, to help offset certain income taxes each year. The tax credit has been at 692 or $692 since fiscal 11. The uh, county executive's recommended budget continues to keep this at $692. Um, this is one of the largest tax credit expenditures that the council approves um, in fiscal 20, which is the latest data we have. More than 243,000 properties received this tax credit for a total of $168.5 million um, in assistance provided to, to resident homeowners. Um, as also noted, the staff report came out prior to the public hearing for this item on May uh, May 4th. There was one um, testimony related to the homestead tax credit as well as um, tying that application process to the income tax offset credit. The council has received testimony similar to this before. Um, and rather than getting too involved into it, I, council staff believes this is just an item that the council or the committee could take up at a later date, um, given how many properties it could impact in such a short manner. Um, the Homestead Tax Credit application is uh, required by the state in order to receive that. But in order to receive the current of the county's income tax offset credit, there is no application. It is automatically provided by SDAT based on um, qualified properties. And finance and SDAT work every year to make sure that qualified properties are receiving it and not rental properties. Um, obviously, some could slip through the cracks, as Mr. Weiland has suggested. Um, but given the number of properties that are not currently, um, that have not applied for the Homestead tax credit, um, in 2016, it was 96,000. Um, there could be a significant number of properties that would lose this benefit. And so I, council staff just believes in, in all fairness to note what was said since it was not in the packet, but also believes we should just come back to this item rather than make a, a quick change in the middle of the process. Um, the other item I'll note with the with the income tax offset credit is that the process will change moving forward should the council or the executive wish to change this tax credit. So now that the tax rate is the item that is the charter limit that the council will look at, um, any changes to this tax, tax credit will result in changes to revenues that year. So um, in table one on page three, council staff just provided some illust illustrative and examples, um, moving the tax credit down to $650 in fiscal 22 would result in almost $10 million of resources available to the council. Um, vice versa, if the council increased the tax credit to $750, um, it would need to find about $14 million in resources to provide that. So that is a very different process moving forward than what the council previously saw. Um, and so with that, again, the executive has recommended $692 for this. The council will consider the GO committee's recommendation on May 17th and then approve the resolution later with the full omnibus resolutions they approve with tax um, for the fiscal 22 operating budget. All right. Uh, let's see. Any comments from Mr. Covey or Mr. Platt? Mr. Covey? There you are. Oh, you just muted yourself, Mr. Covey. You need to unmute. I am sorry. I'm trying to do this using my hearing aids in my phone, but also looking at You're the computer. Good. So sorry about that. Um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say, I'm sorry, it's an excellent packet. Uh, uh, to Mr. Smith, thank you. Uh, I would note, uh, as, as Mr. Smith noted, that tax credits are, are now a deduction or a reduction of revenues uh, because of the change in the charter limit. Um, and that is illustrated in table one. 
it's just not limited to the uh, income tax offset credit. So if you were to uh, to enact a new tax credit, it's going to reduce revenues uh, to the extent that it will reduce revenues, depending on uh, what you do and, and how many residents it affects and, and the amount of the credit that you're giving. Um, uh, if you want to talk about uh, using the homestead credit uh, flag on the state file, uh, we can do that. I, I, I agree with Gene that it's probably best left to uh, after you're finished with the budget. It's it's too probably too complicated to do right now uh, before you while you're in the midst of it. Um, I, I I would argue, as I have been uh, many 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 times in the past, that. Uh, it is a double-edged sword at best. Uh, a lot of Montgomery County homeowners do not sign up for the homestead tax credit uh, through the state system because they know they're not eligible for the homestead credit. Remember, the homestead credit is the credit cap or assessment cap of uh, 10% uh, annually. And uh, if your assessment isn't growing, at close to 10% a year, then you're not eligible for the homestead credit. And frankly, for the last uh, more than 10 years, most, the ver the vast majority of homeowners have not been eligible for this. Homestead credits uh, hit about 4,500 or so, 5,000 accounts, sometimes 4,000 accounts out of 340 something thousand accounts. Uh, and that's really all I'd like to say for now on, on that particular subject. Thank you, Mr. Covey. I mean, I think we have discussed this before, but we definitely can come back to it. Um, okay. You know, yeah. since there are new council members as well. I think it was probably with the previous council and the previous council. But I think we can definitely come back to it in the summer to have a more robust conversation about this. Councilor Murphyton. Thank you. Well, yeah, I definitely don't think now is a good time to dive into this. It's complicated it only impacts a modest number i do think it's it's worthwhile uh to, to to discuss and so i think putting the marker down that we're going to be discussing it uh after the budget i think is appropriate so i appreciate it being noted uh here and think that the comments are seem reasonable to me that it is a double-edged sword like so much of uh this uh type of policy uh, related to property taxes um just a couple of items. One, thank the whole committee, thank the executive branch, thank everybody who uh, was involved. Uh, this is a great packet, uh, and I think it's partially uh, because we have great staff, uh, Mr. Smith, and also because uh, residents stepped up uh, and uh, simplified our tax code and uh, made it much easier uh, and, and, and much more understandable, much more rational. It should be that a tax credit, when you add credits to people, it costs money. And when you take away credits that exist, it saves money, uh, you know, uh, in terms of revenue projections. Th that is, in any rational tax system, that is how uh, it, it, it would normally work. We now have a rational tax system. Uh, so now uh, it is uh, how it works. I, I do think that uh, this uh, is, is helpful. It's a, it's a significant step in a very positive direction. Uh, 30 years of uh, tax policy. Uh, change now for the first time. I wish we weren't in a pandemic so we would fully appreciate and understand it a little bit better with all of the federal funding and all of the, the, the craziness. It, it really isn't uh, able to be understood or, or highlighted in the way that it uh, likely deserves and the significant step forward that residents facilitated in overwhelming uh, numbers. But, you know, hopefully at a later date, we'll fully appreciate that. I did in that vein, I uh, just uh, wonder uh, if uh, there was any analysis, or there could be, it doesn't have to be for today, uh, but of what the rate would have been under the previous uh, 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 charter limit regime and, and, and what the amount of money. It's very hard to project uh, moving forward, but we could now, we now do have the first case study of, uh, you know, keeping the, uh, the, the uh, tax rate consistent uh, year over year at 0.9785. And so we could look at, you know, what it would be based on the uh, accessible base. So if that's available, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to generate, if it's not available now, which I imagine it likely isn't, uh, I would appreciate that. I think it would be helpful for council members, and I think it would be a productive part of this conversation as we uh, move forward for, for everybody to understand as we think about 
revenue in the broader context and we think about the total budget and there's a lot of other conversations that will be related i think this will be helpful for us to have so just wanted to request that if it's available now we'd love to see it if it's not available now we'd love that to be able to be developed at a time when staff is able to uh, put that forward uh, for us and, and, and for the public and i just wanted to thank again colleagues for uh, all the work that went into the, the the change to the property taxes and most importantly to residents uh, who, who stepped up i will point out that uh, the uh, wall street uh, uh, financial experts uh, the next day said that uh, montgomery county's fiscal health was improved based on the decision made by residents uh, that's a significant positive step in a, a very good direction and uh, now we're we're ratifying the the uh, result of that vote for the first time and so i just wanted to make sure that i noted uh, the fact that residents really stepped up here so thank you Thank you, Council Member Friedson, for, for making those comments. Uh, you know, perhaps this is not the most uh, exciting thing that we, we all get to, to talk about, but it's it's absolutely what helps us be able to do so many more extraordinary things. Very critical component. And uh, I think this team in general, um, you know, always steps up and, and does the right thing. And so I'm, I'm also very grateful. Um, for that. Uh, all right. So, uh, Mr. Smith, can you summarize then the recommendations that we can vote? Um, well, actually, if we want to do them both, I'll, I'll go ahead and go through the way it yeah. real quick. Um, we've already talked some about it. So the new charter limit is now the weighted rate that was the previous fiscal year. Um, that's going to be 0 0.9785 per $100 of assessed value. That's what the county executive has recommended for this budget. Um, all uh, estimates, both for current properties, new construction, and personal property taxes um, at that rate, it'll generate um, roughly $1,884,000 <laughs> um, or $1.8 billion worth of, of, of tax revenues for fiscal 22. Um, one thing that council staff notes that under the new charter limit, the civil majority can improve the current rate um, or less than the rate. Obviously, if the council decides it wants to exceed the weighted rate, um, it would need all nine votes or all council members present. When, I mean, all council members would need to vote affirmatively for it. Um, and the last thing I'll note, since I've had some questions about this, the weighted rate will not appear in the tax resolution that the council approves. The council approves multiple tax rates. It's the weighted rate comes together as one tax rate based on all of those combined. Um, and so tax residents who are listening at home or council members who are going to listen later, um, you will not see the weighted rate other than published in the budget. Um, there will be multiple tax rates the council sets, and all of those will yield that weighted rate through, uh, through the math that finance does every year. Um, so with that, the, the committee should make its recommendations, both for the ITOC, um, whether it should be different than 692, um, and the weighted rate, whether it should be different than 0, 0 0.9785 per $100. If not, it'll just recommend the county executive's recommendation. All right, uh, colleagues, uh, any objection to the county executive's recommendation here? All right, so we will adopt those two recommendations. Thank you, everybody. It's good seeing you, Mr. Company and Mr. Platt. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Okay, so now we're going to move on to our operating budget consent items. Uh, these are items that we, they're pretty straightforward in terms of the fact that there aren't, you know, changes, uh, controversial issues, et cetera. So we're going to move through them pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to start with the Department of Technology Services. I believe Mr. Torregas is the um, analyst for this piece. Uh, what I see here is that the county executive is requesting $44,642,174. That uh, is 166.25 full-time equivalents, an increase of 3.02, and a one full-time equivalent from FY21 numbers. Um, and um, council staff has noted that there have been some adjust adjustments um, that will have service impacts. An increase of $500,000 for FiberNet 2 maintenance to renew infrastructure, an increase of, of $557,072 for a new software license costs for Veronis Oracle in net motion, and a decrease of $315,100 for the termination of 51 Monroe Street lease, which is no longer needed. So those are some the those are the adjustments contained in this recommendation. Uh, Dr. Torregas, anything you would like to add? to that recommendation that you have included in your packet? 
No, two two quick things. Uh, Council Member Friedson asked to explore the E-rate potential to offset some of the costs we have. And indeed, our technology and enterprise business solutions department is looking into it. And the budget uh, includes several uh, initiatives in this area. The second one is that the uh, TEBS, uh, our new DTS, is now uh, has now concluded a cloud readiness assessment. And I look forward to 2022 fiscal because we will be able to see migration of significant programs into the cloud having concluded that assessment. With that, I recommend the approval. All right, colleagues, any questions, any comments? Without objection, we will uh, approve that uh, county executive recommendation and county um, staff, or county council staff recommendation. Item 10D, device client management, NDA. Uh, in the packet, um, Mr. Teregas has included the county executive is requesting twelve million two hundred and twenty-five thousand seven hundred and fifty-one dollars thirty-one point seven percent increase from FY twenty-one, and that is for Microsoft annual license renewal for improved replacement cycle for PCs and desktops, which are really important, and for new software license costs for. Mongar and Zoom, obviously a lot of adaptation because of the pandemic. <laughs> um, so anything else, uh, Dr. Torregas, regarding that item? No, also to, to recognize the good work that Gail Roper and her staff have done in bringing Microsoft licensing back to the county in a robust manner. So now we have end-to-end -end protection, no matter where you start and where you end up, which we didn't have before in a robust manner. So it is an increase in the budget, but I totally support it and, and I would recommend approval. Thank you, Mr. Torregas. And you're, yes, I think Ms. Roper has done amazing work in the time that she's been with the county uh, in really moving us forward. All right, any objection to this recommendation, colleagues? No objections, so we will, we will approve that item. Item 10C is the Interagency Technology Policy and Coordination Committee, also known as ITPCC. Non-departmental account NDA, and it's a request of three thousand dollars, which is the same as FY twenty one. And this is a really dynamic group that, uh, for many years, has looked at ways of leveraging resources and working on projects that really, I think, um, have become uh, a model uh, for us. And so, very small amount uh, that allows them to do, you know, some of their work. Um, and so let's see, Dr. Torega, is anything additional here? Again, just very briefly, um, in July 1, 2021, you should expect to see recommendations for new leadership in ITPCC. As, as you remember, the ITPC is chaired by one of the, your six agencies, and the CIO subcommittee is chaired by the CIO of that same agency. Uh, so it's a two year rotating thing. Uh, um, um, Montgomery County Governor has said it for two terms. And it's now time to rotate it. So staff will be working hard to find the next excellent uh, chair for that uh, initiative. And the second thing is, I just want to point out that the packet itself, for measly three thousand dollars, has very, very important information because each agency has written out for the count for the committee, for the council, and for the general public uh, that, that downloads that package all the work that they've done in terms of COVID and racial equity. Have. Uh, it's a significant uh, packet, so I would urge you to uh, spread it around. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Any objection to the $3,000 request? <laughs> Great. We will adopt that. 10D is telecommunications NDA, and the uh, request is for $5,356,382. Dr. Torregas. Again, very briefly, um, we're looking forward to perhaps losing our actual physical telephones and going to software-defined telephony and internet-based telephony uh, very soon. So it's a, it's a, it's a level effort, uh, and I recommend funding, uh, continuing the funding at the same level. Any objection to this effort? All right, with that, it is unanimous. 10E is procurement, and um, for this, I believe we have Dr. Torregas and Mr. Mia. The request from the executive is four million four hundred and thirty-three thousand two hundred and eighty-three, um, and this is a two point eight increase from FY twenty-one, so very slight. Uh, and uh, any additional comments on that item? 
Uh, my quick contribution is that uh, procurement has done an amazing job with limited resources in, in time of pandemic. They were able to step up and use technology extremely effectively since they couldn't come into into work physically. Um, the, the, uh, in the fall, when your committee will have a chance, Ms. Navarro, to review performance, we we look forward to hearing from from that committee, uh, from that uh, uh, procurement uh, office, a, a status report on the center-led procurement strategy that was envisioned for 21 and suspended due to COVID. It's a, it's a new and dynamic uh, process, and Mr. Shetty, I think, it has um, uh, all the, 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 the drive to bring some new models of procurement uh, within departments, uh, and uh, you will want to hear from him uh, in the fall. Excellent. All right, any objection from my colleagues? We approve this recommendation. <clears throat> Next item is Cable 10F. The executive is requesting $17,469,611, and this is a 5.8 increase from FY21. Dr. Regas. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to, um, to inform the committee members uh, that I received uh, a communication from uh, Ms. Sue present uh, this morning at uh, 836, uh, I'm sorry, at 1040 a.m., uh, asking for this committee uh, to pull the item and to have subsequent discussions uh, because of concerns that she articulated that have to do with the ability or the uh, excess fees or lack thereof that uh, the county uh, uh, collects from industry. Um, my own recommendation is to leave it in the consent calendar and to approve it. Although I think Ms. Uh, uh, President has some uh, some strong points that it is time to review uh, the, um, the the process of setting prices for uh, uh, power uh, review. And I suggest that uh, given the fact that the Fed Committee also has extensive uh, uh, dealings with uh, power siding and power uh, review pricing, uh, that um, you uh, organize a joint committee session between GEO and Fed in the summer to take up the whole process of tower review and tower uh, fee pricing. Uh, I don't think that also Ms. President um, uh, in her email to me, which I think was for a word to Eurosis as well, made mention of the fact that this is using taxpayer dollars. In fact, the Tower Review Commission is in fact uh, funded through cable revenues and that's why I'm briefing you on this during the cable uh, fund discussion. There are a couple of other issues on the on the cable fund that I wanted to just briefly highlight, but let me stop here and see if there are any questions. I don't think we have questions, but I do think that we can come back to the item that Great. you had uh, described. Great. Um, the, the cable um, uh, uh, plan is a way for this committee and the full council to approve a, a, a manner of uh, investing uh, the franchise fees and other fees that the county collects. Uh, those fees, because of cable cutting and other practices by the general public, have been declining over time. Uh, the time has come to take a, look, a long, hard look at uh, the way that uh, we fund items through the uh, uh, cable plan. The executive has made a decision to transfer $700,000 from the general fund and um, uh, to, to make the, the, the balance. But I think uh, you as a committee need to be informed of subsequent uh, steps that may be taken in fiscal 22 to rebalance uh, the cable plan. The cable plan is balanced today and I support it uh, and would um, uh, recommend its adoption by you. Um, the, the second very quick thing is that the uh, Connect Montgomery Alliance uh, it has affirmed a strong focus on racial equity. Uh, you met with them uh, a few weeks ago and you asked them to do so. Uh, <clears throat> they also requested in that discussion a, a CMA coordinator, a Connect Montgomery Alliance coordinator, uh, to help coordinate the activities of the, of the various uh, agencies. And OMB uh, is, is looking into this and will be uh, rebalancing or redirecting some of the existing funds in the cable plan with no changes uh, to make that happen. Those are the only comments I have. I recommend uh, the approval. Okay, great. Then we'll come back to that item as well outside of budget. So without objection, colleagues, item 10F. 
10G is the Office of Legislative Oversight. Mr. Sinar, the county executive, has included a request of two million one hundred ninety-eight thousand six hundred and fifty-two dollars. This is an eight point two <coughs> increase, uh, and uh, there's an increase of one FTE. And uh, beforehand, just really want to thank you and your team, Mr. Sinar, for all your work. I think. Every Every single day, we identify a new possible <laughs> uh, report from OLO that we need. So um, you're all very gracious and also very professional. And uh, I think the public is very well served by your very, uh, you know, in-depth uh, analyses and, and support that you give uh, us that helps, uh, you know, further our legislative uh, work. So major appreciation. Anything you would like to uh, add to the uh -huh. recommendation? The only thing I would say is the uh, increase is just for the planning and social equity analysts that we are actually now in the process of hiring. Um, that will be conducting the uh, analysis that was assigned to us um, by the law last year. So the job announcement is up. Um, so anybody who watching who wants to apply. Wonderful. That would be an important addition for our work. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Without objection, colleagues. We accept the request from the executive. Item 10H is the independent audit NDA, and the county executive is recommending 426,782.3% increase from FY21.33 FTEs. Mr. Sebar. Yeah, again, that this is you know, no change really over last year. This is the first year that we've gone with the new firm, the first full year, and we've been very happy. Um, I think that they're doing a great job. Um, so that's all I'll say with that. Um, we will be Possibly we'll have extra money. So if there are areas where you would like to do extra external audits that we could assign to this firm, um, that probably will exist this year. Um, costs came in a little bit lower than we thought they would last year. Great. That sounds good. All right. Any objection, colleagues? All right. Hearing none, we adopt that item. And then the last item is 10I, Charter Review Commission, NDA. And this is a very big item of $1,150. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Willens, anything you'd like to add regarding this very important item? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. And um, really don't have anything to add. Obviously, happy to answer any questions. As you can see, this is not a change in the Charter Review Commission's budget. And um, to the extent they're watching, just, you know, uh, thank you to the Charter Review members. They are a very uh, dedicated group. Um, and as you know, they serve the council uh, it's a group of residents who are appointed by you to serve the council uh, to provide recommendations on approving our county charter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wellens. And yes, thank you to the Charter Review Commission. They've been very busy and I think have worked really hard to put forth some really important uh, changes to our charter. All right, colleagues, without objection. Okay, so we are... I think ready to adjourn 15 minutes early, I think roughly 14 minutes early or something like wow. that. Wow. Maybe we should talk about that thousand dollars a week. <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, colleagues. Good good work. Thank you so much. This was thank you. We just got rid we just finished our, our 19 item geo <laughs> sessions. So kudos. Everybody deserves a little a cup of tea or something like that. There you go. All right. Sounds thank you. Good. Thank you all.